He was the leader of the Monster Squad. Today, on the Slices Podcast with Jason Poligra, we sit down with actor Andre Gow. Hey everybody, this is Jason Poligra. Welcome to the Slices Podcast. Today on the show, we have the leader of the Monster Squad, Mr. Andre Gower. How are you doing, Andre? Uh, so far, so good. Um, and it looks like it's just getting better because uh, we're doing this. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you so much for being on the show. <laughs> uh, I think I speak for a lot of people and I, you know, forgive me for being redundant. I'm sure you've heard this a lot, but you know, your film means a lot to people my age and uh and um and i was one of the ones that saw it at the time so i'm uh, <laughs> oh wow you're <laughs> yeah. you're in a you're in a, a coveted small group there Jason. exactly well you know what yeah you're right but uh so i did show my support <laughs> in 87 so well we 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 appreciate that awesome so i want to get right into it so um were you a monster fan before the film began I, I enjoyed genre films. I enjoyed yeah. horror movies. Uh, you know, this was, you know, mid eighties. So, you know, slashers were popular. We had just come out with, you know, probably our time was Freddie, Jason, you know, things like that. I, I enjoyed them. I was, I was honestly, when I was a little kid, I was a little scared of, of the scary stuff, you know, yeah. and creatures, not so much, but like, you know, some weird stuff that you don't understand. I remember seeing the exorcist at way too young of an age. <laughs> so, and you watch it now, you're like, Oh, yeah, it's, it's still it's still kind of creepy. Yeah, um, I, I dug them. I was interested. You know, I grew up in this business. So, you know, starting in TV and film when you're five, you know how things are made and you're you're kind of inside, but still doesn't mean you can't get affected or, or scared or something by a movie just because of a situation when you're, you know, young age. But I, I did enjoy them. I monsters are different. I grew up more of a, um, uh, you know, because you had to go to the movie theater, obviously, back in our yeah. day, you know, to see the new ones. And there wasn't really cable. So you, and there's no streaming, obviously. So you couldn't just pop on whatever you wanted. So you were able to see what was available. Uh, but then if you lived in a big market, like I, I grew up in, you know, born and raised in Los Angeles, you had not just your network TV, but you had some local affiliates and things like that, that would show old movies, you know, on Saturday mornings or late night, Friday nights, things like that. And so you got to see some of the old stuff, which was kind of cool. And I've always been a creature from the Black Lagoon fan. He's my guy. So he's your guy. Like, he's my guy. Like monsters, he's my guy. Of our era of new stuff, Freddy's probably the scariest villain, whether he's a creature, monster, villain, whatever he is, yeah. because he's not real. He's in your mind. So that was just terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like Jason, I could get away from. No problem. I just run. <laughs> Yeah. Or I'll lightly jog and I could take care of it, right? <laughs> um, but Freddie, you can't, you can't escape him. That was so, terrifying. And, and the reason why I ask is because, um, you know, it, it's kind of funny because your film appealed to so many uh, kids your age that were, you know, knee deep or neck deep in loving monsters. You know, so I always wondered, like, you know, when working on it, like, you know, because you're in this for what a lot of uh, us would have deemed a, a dream project. Yeah. You know, I'm always curious to know, you know, your frame of mind heading in. Obviously, you know, now things have changed, but, you know, um, I, I want to know if, like, you know, you were a fan of the Universal Monster films, but you were right because they were hard to watch back then. Like, you had to be up at 3 a.m. on a random night and hope that, you know, something was on, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Or, or, you know, Saturday, you know, Saturdays were awesome because you could go outside and play with your friends or if you had sports to play, you played those. But you woke up and you did cartoons yeah, and ate some, you know, cereal that was terrible for you. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, and then you went out and played and then you came back and you had Kung Fu theater, you know, followed <laughs> up by sci-fi theater or some, you know, horror movie that ran. And that's where we got a lot of that, you know, exposure. Yeah. And honestly, at the time I was probably more of a sci-fi kid and a kung fu theater kid yeah, yeah um but they're they're all the same now yeah. monsters in in particular are super fascinating just because um you know what what they stand for you know mm -hmm. and what they what they mean um you know they you know they represent kind of archetypes in the human condition or the human experience they're usually kind of physical manifestations of certain you know social epics or eras that we go through as a society yeah. which of course when you're eight you have no idea what that means <laughs> yeah. uh when you're 28 some people don't know what that <laughs> means um 
but you learn that later and like, oh, that's very interesting. But you know, you knew things being on the set of Monster Squad, like Dracula is this kind of, this is the, that's the guy, I think. I think Dracula's yeah. the, mon- like he's the guy. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, you know, I werewolf mean, was... you know, with our wolf man is, is, is iconic as well. We had all the icons, right? Yeah, so no, you did. You, you did. can't get away from it. So you did. And you were the, and it was the first one since back then. And, and, and when I say back then, I mean, we're talking, you know, just a couple of years into talkies, you know? So like, I mean, these, yeah. these are just embedded in the roots of film in our minds and, and, um, Anyways, we'll, we're going to get more into uh, into all that kind of stuff. But I want to know a little bit about the audition process. Uh, did you, you obviously auditioned, I'm assuming. Was it a, a big casting call or was it? Uh... You know, I, 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 I think I know it was. Um, you know, that's a better question for someone like Fred. Um, yeah. But, you know, it was, that was right in the middle of the time where I was doing a lot of work. I was fortunate enough to be one of the kid actors that, that worked quite a bit and had been on shows had been on other films and, you know, was, was able to get asked to go audition. Um, not everybody, you know, was, it was in that position, but when you're of that age in a certain, you know, time frame, and you're at that kind of upper 20%, say of, um, uh, of visibility, maybe, um, y- you read for everything. Yeah. And you're going to, you know, everybody, all your friends, you're, you're all going to read for the same stuff. And you see yeah. everybody every day in the, in, in the hallway waiting to, to read for stuff. And I, you know, I just remember this, um, you know, it was a regular call from your agent. Hey, you know, go pick up this. This is back in the day, pre, obviously pre-internet, pre-fax machine. You know, if you wanted the sides, you know, which was the scenes you had to read, if you wanted them early, you went the day before, or you went an hour early wow. um, to learn the lines. And you know, it's just a regular audition day. And I don't even remember if it was the only one that day, if it was tucked into like three or four, um, wow. not the very first one, but yeah. I do, I do remember, you know, it was a big movie. I uh, had a big budget. It was, you know, all these monsters yeah. and that's all you got, you yeah, know, and then you yeah. pick up, you know, a couple of signs and, you know, maybe you, you may or may not know, or, you know, your, your, your viewers may or may not know that uh, I never actually auditioned for the role of Sean. No, you didn't. I, uh, I originally, auditioned and call back and screen test and producer got all for the role of Rudy. And so what, what's really interesting about how it all, you know, comes to pass is, you know, when you're, whether you're a kid or an adult, kind of like your look or your body of work, your style is, you know, kind of what you read for, you know? Um, and up until that time, like the last two or three or four things I had done on television had been, Oh, the cool kid with the, you know, great hair, a lot of hair product and a leather jacket or, you know, stylish clothes. And they're like, oh, obviously Andre reads for this, you know, kind of, you know, supporting role of Rudy because he's, you know, the cool kid because he just came off a TV show like that or something. And what can then read it? And I remember, I remember the, you know, the, the audition scene originally of of Rudy and it was was the scene, it was the scene in the, in the treehouse in the second act where, uh, you know, him and Patrick are asking Patrick's sister, um, uh, what her con- current condition happens to be. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 And, um, <laughs> you know, which, you know, un- unbeknownst to us, you know, can either help you save or not save the world at the time. <laughs> um, and that was one of the audition scenes and, you know, not ever reading for Sean was interesting because you get a call a couple, you know, a week or two later and, you know, your agent is like, Hey, you know, that movie you read for a couple of weeks ago, uh, they cast you in it. And you're like, Oh my God, that's great. Yeah. Cause that's what you always want to hear. Yeah. Right? And they said, well, you know, but they didn't, um, they actually cast you in a different role. And usually that's bad news. Yeah. Cause usually it's the, it's usually it's the a reverse. lesser role or a small, yeah. it's usually, this happened to be for some reason, completely the opposite. And at the time, I didn't know why. Now, obviously, we know why is because Ryan Lambert walked in there and absolutely murdered his auditions for Rudy and became Rudy in that instant. Yeah. And I don't think there's a it, look, everybody read for everything in this movie, all the names that you know at the time. Yeah. And, you know, they they somehow had the, you know, the inspiration or the foresight to, you know, kind of cast Ryan as Rudy and then I always, you know, especially in the last couple of years, I've really thought about it more of being, realizing how fortunate I actually was Mm -hmm. to be thought of in a different perspective. Like, I don't know who it was, whether it was Fred or Peter Himes or Penny Perry, the casting director to say, 
you know, we're looking for a Sean and we've read like five dozen or probably. Um, what about that kid that read for Rudy that would he let's let's cut his yeah. hair off and yeah. take the gunk out of his hair and can he be Sean? Yeah. And then I I I I'm pretty sure I never read for anything as Sean. Uh, you know, we're getting older, but yeah. uh, they just called him, you know, odd man. No, they gave you the lead. Like they cast you as the lead, like out of your Rudy auditions, which is, I think sometimes very rare. And, yeah. but I do feel for it because someone in that room or in that group said, wait a minute, what about that kid that read for Rudy? Yeah. Would he be Sean? And they're like, you know what? That's a great idea. Someone, obviously <laughs> someone said, hey, maybe that's a good idea. So who knows if it was or not, you know, a time will that's tell. But, cool. uh, yeah. You know, that was that was sort of that process. Wow, that's a great story. I um at the time, because okay, so you get the starring role, but at the time, you know, Rudy gets the cool role. Were you a little upset <laughs> yeah. about that or uh, you- no doubt? Absolutely. Yeah. It's like they said, No, you got cast as a lead. I was like, No, Rudy <laughs> you know, kills more monsters, has the jacket, yeah. gets to shoot, gets to shoot everything, and uh, you know, gets the cute girl at the end and things like that. So yeah. Uh, you know, that's always, you know, everybody wants to be Rudy. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, it's Rudy. true in, in, in <laughs> life in general, right? But uh, it all worked out clearly. <laughs> that's, that's what I was meaning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everybody wants to be Rudy, but yep. we're usually either, you know, the insufferable know it all kind of bossy kid, Sean, or, you know, <laughs> the, you know, kind of sidekick that you got to figure out what his role is being Patrick. Uh, yeah. And most of us are usually, you know, or you're a Horace. Yeah. And, uh, but that's, what's interesting about these characters is that's what all these kids connected to was, 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 yeah. was the kids, that's was awesome. the kids I, as characters. I was very much like you actually, because I remember, you know, kind of being the leader of my little group and telling everybody to shut up all the time. And like, right. I was, you know, I had to get, get things on track. So I related right. to the character, um, uh, very much. Is it true? Did you have some input in who got cast? I, I, you know, I that probably very little. I know there yeah. was, um, you know, there was once I was cast as Sean, I think they had to fill, uh, I, I think they were trying to fill, you know, Horace and, uh, and I know Patrick because that hadn't been cast yet. And they had done the casting process in New York and LA and narrowed it down to a few names. And I do remember having to, um, I had, I like spent a day with the, the, the kid that they had narrowed down for Patrick yeah. Uh, uh, you know, as the New York choice. And I already knew the LA choice, which happened to be Robbie Kiger because yeah. we had grown up together and, you know, had grown up in this business. And, um, yeah. you know, at the age of 13, we were veterans, you know. Yeah, the, yeah. The, yeah. And yeah. Um, but so we, there was this kid and they're like, hey, you know, we're going to take you out, send a car and like, you got to meet and like, you just hang out with this kid for the day and like have lunch. And mm. like me and my mom <laughs> had to hang out with, uh, this kid and his mom for the day and did you like doing uh, that re- stuff <laughs> well that was fun because you it's always weird to be put in a situation where you got to spend time with someone you don't know yeah right and as, especially you know, as a 13 year old yeah but i i look back because i think we went to like I, we might have even had i don't know why you would go to a movie with someone like that because you're supposed to interact but we might have gone <laughs> to see a movie or thought yeah. about it but we spent like the afternoon at the beverly center uh which was a brand new mall you know in in, in west la and uh, it was this like you know the short kid the shock of red hair and he was super energetic and was a you could tell he was a comedy kind of you know just had a comedy mind yeah and yeah. i was like what is this bundle of energy that yeah. has just come to L- like what is happening here <laughs> and uh I, I, and that was my only interaction and i don't know if they asked or someone I, I might have said like well i know robbie so like you know robbie's cool i I don't think I made any casting decisions. No, yeah, um, but... and of course Robbie's you know fantastic as Patrick because he's you know he's got his little you know sly side side eye comments yeah. and, and great reactions. Um, but what's interesting is the 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 lasting effect of that hanging out at the mall you know at the Beverly Center with uh, Seth Green and his mom, that's and funny. that's who the kid you know that we had to spend the day with that was you know on a final screen test for Monster Squad that's and. Nice what's what's crazy is a very short time after that because uh seth and his family's from philadelphia okay. and he would audition in new york and had worked a ton i i didn't know him because yeah different side of the planet yeah and yeah, yeah. you know to me and that time, yeah. shortly after that because that had been like the second or third time or fourth time he had come to la to screen t- they were like this is where i think so his, him and his family moved to la and uh-huh. uh, it was shortly after that monster squad uh you know kind of process 
And luckily he, they, he did that mm-hmm. um, because he came to LA and became Seth Green, who is, yeah. you know, one of my favorite people in the world, not just as a pal, yeah. Um, cause we're close, but we don't get to hang out all the time, but we've known each other for so long, but he really is one of the nicest dudes in the industry and uh, does, does great work. That's pretty cool. That's a cool story. So this was all shot in LA, correct? Correct. Yeah. So how long was the shooting total for you? Uh, I worked about three months, three months and change straight. Um, it's you know, and then when, you know, it, it's, it was exhausting. Yeah. And, uh, you know, what's crazy, you know, when you're dealing they always say don't work with kids or animals, you know, yep. in, in, in film speak. And there's a reason. One, they're always difficult. And you don't know what you're going to get. And, um, you know, animals don't speak your language and neither do yeah. kids. And um, unless you know how to work with them. And I think that's what we lucked out, you know, with, with Fred and, and, and Shane just being not that much older than we were <laughs> as screenwriters and a director, really. And that's why, that's why I think the story and the dialogue, that's a whole other, you know, track of conversation works for yeah. people. Um but it was, I mean, it was a tough, and being the lead, you're mm-hmm. in, you're working every day, just yeah. out. There's only a few days that I wasn't on set or on camera. Yeah. And then of course, if you're even not on camera, but you're in the movie, you got to go to where your set is yours and, and go to school because yeah. you got, you have, you have to, you have to report every day anyway. Yeah. So I remember of my shooting schedule of, of being every day, except for one. And they had to work around mm-hmm. me. I was just really sick one day. Like I was yeah. just like, I was worn out. It was, I think it was a Friday, which was lucky. Yeah. And they were like, all right, we'll work around it. You know, we'll change. And I, I feel bad about kind of doing that and, you know, and, and having to bail, well, but one uh, day. I, I think it was, to, I think it was, to, yeah, but one day can screw up an entire production. <laughs> yeah. um, but then you hear like all these stories about all these other people, like, oh, I walked off set for like a week and I'm like, what? Yeah, <laughs> I'm exactly. like, I felt bad about being sick and, and I just know, going right? down. But um, yeah, it was, um, I don't want to say it was a blur because I remember most of it, yeah. uh, but it was, a, you know, it's a lot of work and you're dealing with kids. You can only be there for, you can only be on set or on property for so many hours a day. And you have to yeah. be in school so many days and you can only be in front of the camera for so many hours. Yeah. So it's very regimented and you, the, everybody thinks like a movie set, something like fun and awesome, like monster squad or just be kind of like this, uh, you know, a, a free pass to, you know, an amusement park. Yeah, yeah. And it's not, it's all work. And especially since you're the kids, you can't fart mm-hmm. around. Yeah. Like you've got to show up, you got to know what you're doing and you got to be professional. Cause they're probably looking out. for it. Right. They're probably looking for you to like, you know, be a little bit off so they can, you know. Yeah. Because you, there's no time and time on a set is money. And, yep. you know, if you're goofing off or not knowing your lines or not paying attention or sick for a day, mm-hmm. um, you know, that, that puts a, that puts a monkey in the wrench. Yeah. But this and, is perspective um, of, your, of you, tough. because you, I mean, this is where you become, you said you were a veteran already at that time. And that <laughs> is that, I mean, that's a blessing for the production, your mentality right there. That's why I'm like bringing it up and uh, I don't mean to interrupt, but like, yeah. Your perspective it w- uh, must have been a dream for the production because, I, you know, at your age. Well, it's a good point, And I hope so. I hope I was certainly, uh, you know, a kind of, um, you know, uh, sturdy kind of, you know, buoy for, for yeah. the whole thing. Uh, look, there was much more veteran, much more trained, much more capable actors mm. around us on that set. Uh, you know, including Stephen Mock and Tom Noonan yeah. and especially Duncan Regeer and and even Mary Ellen Trainer and but yeah. I think all of that blended in, yeah. you know, with the kind of enthusiasm and the blend of professionalism and, and experience of some of the kids, uh, you know, that that really made it work. Mm-hmm. And I, I hope I I hope I brought that to the set. Yeah. I don't know because I'm you know I only have my kind of you know perspective from yeah. that. Um, but I try to be and. Yeah. Um, and, you know, yeah. And, and maybe that was something that they saw. I don't know. Who knows? Awesome. What was Hopefully. day one? Do you remember day one? On that? Yeah. Day one. Um, day one for me was actually day one of, of Sean, the character uh, of being in the principal's office and uh, doing the uh, interior hallway uh, with Mrs. Cathead and, yeah. um, uh, and outside uh, was also uh, Rudy's intro. I think that was either the first day, the second half of the first day or the se- first of the second day where he um, saves uh, Horace. Um, but yeah, for me, I, I believe it was in the principal's office with Robbie um, and with Spider with Human Head and then the hallway shot. And it's interesting because kind of that memory came up, what was it, two weeks ago or so, because there was actually, um, 
a kid on set that during that hallway walk, um, mm -hmm. we shot a scene. Um, I swear we shot it. Fred, Fred just posted like we didn't even shoot it, but maybe we rehearsed it and didn't shoot it. Um, where a kid runs up to, to, to Sean and they trade like baseball cards or something. I mean, it's a really quick, like five second thing. And then he goes, and it's just sort of supposed to be like interaction in the school hallway. Yeah. And, uh, that kid was actually, uh, Dustin Diamond. And, so, and, and I mean, super young, he was probably like, I don't know, 10 at the time maybe. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, hadn't done Saved by the Bell yet, hadn't done much. And he was just kind of this kid with this, you know, big head of hair, curly hair, and kind of this long face and this kind of goofy expression. And <laughs> yeah, I was like, yeah. who is this kid? Like, <laughs> wow. I was like, what, again, what is happening here? And I Amazing. almost wish that, you know, that, that little tidbit was still in, it was still on camera because that'd have been kind of cool. But yeah, uh, you know, that was, you know, that's, that's bad news, you know, for yeah. you know, someone like Dustin to, to go out like that. Yeah. Yeah. No, that was, uh, that's pretty fresh right now. And that would have been pretty cool because yeah, but yeah, that, was, that was day one. That was day yeah. one on monster. Squad. Really? Eh? So Dustin diamond was there. All right. So all in all, were you kids, uh, tight on set or was there, cause you guys were the same age, but you weren't like, I mean, there was some step and at that time, like, you know, a couple of years is huge right but, but at that like, time it makes a big it sure yeah. makes a big difference you know when yes. you're 10 you're not hanging out with 13 year olds exactly um, and when you're 13 you're not hanging out with 16 year olds mm -hmm. uh ryan was the oldest by uh, he's he's a year like a year and change older than i am mm -hmm. and uh, robbie and i are, are fairly close. close but then it was uh brent who was uh, i think 11 or maybe close to 20. he was really young yeah and um and then of course michael was six and ashley yeah. was five uh so you know, we had, I had, I had known Robbie. Robbie was the only kid I knew. Yeah. And we had known each other for years. Um, I knew Michael because I knew his older brother. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which, okay, is yeah. David, which is David, David Fosino. Yep. Cause yep. we're the same age. Yeah. Uh, David and I are, are a similar age and um, Ryan and I had met, I don't know, a few weeks prior to starting shooting. Cause uh, we had met at a party and we're like, wait, Oh, Aren't we doing yeah. a movie together next month? And so that was, and I have a picture from that night, which is really so cool. Holly, like the night right? we met. It's so like, oh, That's aren't we funny. doing a movie and two wings? And like, great. Um, <laughs> it's awesome. Uh, but uh, I mean, that happens, right? Yeah, no, um, that's, I love it. <laughs> it's, it's different than like, aren't we going to the same summer camp next year? Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, which everybody else gets to do. Yeah. Uh, In Toronto, it's like, you know, all right, hey, weren't we on the same hockey team? Th that's so right yeah didn't you play like uh level b you know yeah. youth league hockey with coach you know mittendorf or something um, <laughs> yeah that's it man yeah and um it's <laughs> yeah it's yeah it's it's kind of a unique existence but yeah um, we you know it, it takes some time where you put a group of kids whether they're related or not related whether you know yeah. each other or not in that compressed space and you know you're trying to you know you're trying to work you're trying to do school you're trying to figure out who you are uh, and just because it's on a movie set doesn't mean you don't have those regular kind of human kid, you know, adolescent dynamics and yeah. everybody's got to figure out what's going on. Um, yeah, you're all playing um, fictional characters, but you're all real people when you're yeah. off, you know, out of costume and all this. You've got to figure out and get used to each other. Yeah. And, you know, honestly, it didn't, I don't think it took that long. Yeah, um, that's good. You know, it, I, I think there were some, you know, you're going to have your kid antics and you're goofing off. And um, I do remember there was probably like in the first week or two, uh, Brent being younger, uh, you know, felt maybe overwhelmed that maybe, you know, something, you know, we'd be, you know, active doing something or, or, or in the school or, you know, goofing off with each other, you know, not work wise. Um, and then like, we kind of, you know, had a meet up and it was like, look, let's all kind of tone that down. And, yeah. and, um, and, and, and that's the only thing I remember. I think one of the producers came in one day and, and took Ryan and I, cause we were the oldest. It was like, Hey, you know, it's going to take a while. We're here for a long time. Yeah. You know, let's just make everybody feel kind of cool, include everybody. And, um, yeah. you know, you know, don't try to cause any hijinks or anything like that, which I don't think we were, but it was just those regular kind of get used to dynamics and stuff. Yeah. And, um, but I think everybody was, was kind of perfectly kind of cast and everything. Mm -hmm. And it all kind of fell in. And, you know, even though I only knew Robbie and met Ryan a couple of weeks before, I, I think we, it, it came across that we all knew each other for years. Like we all yeah. grew up in the same neighborhood oh, for you know, sure. in, in Sean's treehouse. So I think it yeah. worked. It looks rehearsed. Like it looks like you guys had some rehearsals and you guys uh, had a chance to bond. Like, you know, and that's, uh, sure. I don't know, but you didn't, I'm assuming. 
I mean, not too much prior mm-hmm. to shooting. It was normally during your shoot days that you would yeah. go off. And I remember a lot that Fred would, you know, when we had the time, whether we were either shooting another scene that we weren't in or, or setting up, like he would take us to the side and go, okay, here's what we're doing next and yeah. let's work on it this way and get used to it so you i think that was very smart of taking that time because working with kid actors is completely different than working with adult actors yeah and you realize that when you become an adult and um or try to become an adult <laughs> and you know taking that time ahead of time is where you burn those minutes and and, and kind of narrow it down to get your needs so then when it's go time uh, you're not starting from scratch. Yeah. And I think that was a very you know, cognizant thing that, uh, that Fred knew he wanted to do or mm-hmm. needed to do or should do. And I remember some of those kind of, you know, on the day or the day before type of rehearsals of what we're doing the next day or in the next hour or just after lunch or something. And I remember, especially with Ashley uh, and myself and then even with the other kids of just, because it was about getting those beats and those timings right. Because like you said, you need to bond and you can't have a scene of three kids walking down you know, sidewalk uh, and figuring out who you are. You, yeah. It's got to feel and look like you've known each other your whole lives. Yeah. So you were the leader of the Monster Squad. Did you kind of assume that uh, throughout production or was it just... I don't know if I consciously did. I'm sure if you ask Ryan and everybody else, they were like, oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> um, insufferable know-it-all telling everybody what to do all the time. <laughs> um, but I think I've just always kind of had that mindset of, you know, kind of big picture thinking yeah. and, you know, kind of bird's eye view of where everything needs to be uh, that way. I, Cause I don't really ever get like, ca- you know, caught off guard or, you know, um, or if you do, then you can adjust, but yeah. I don't really, you never really don't know where you are, or where you should be or where things are going. Um, and so I've always been fortunate enough to kind of view things that way. And, um, I, you know, I think that comes across there. And I, I tried to play that role because not only are the leader of the squad, but like, yeah, you're, you're the first card of the movie. Like you're, the, yeah. Yeah. you're the lead of the movie. Are there other adults and, 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 and more competent and experienced actors? No doubt. Um, but like everybody knows, like you're the guy, like you're, yeah. you're that guy. And so I tried to, I tried to hold that up, you know, a little bit and, and, and rally people or encourage them or, you know, it wasn't like, you know, cracking a whip or anything that wasn't yeah. my job, um, or, or should have been, but, uh, you know, I do remember trying to kind of, you know, bring that kind of group mentality. And I remember one thing that, uh, cause I was really into, um, uh, outdoors stuff and I was really into archery at the time which was cool because we had archery and monster squad um, yeah I didn't get to do any but Ryan did would have if you <laughs> um that's right and uh you know I, I used to go to the store all the time that it was it was kind of a big outdoorsy archery kind of uh active store and um, I went and got these kind of like outdoor folding kind of like camp chairs for everybody and I gave everybody a gift so we could all sit around you know that's like cool. just carry these little portable things and yeah uh, you know, try to try to have people over at the house, you know, when you could and, and things like that. So awesome. um, I, I, I think I tried maybe, I don't know if yeah. it succeeded or not, but uh, All right. yeah, it, was, it just, it, it wasn't an uncomfortable position. This looks like uh, a dream job for a kid. Um, and I imagine there are days where it was a lot of fun, but how difficult was this shoot at times? Like, were there times where, this really just kind of got a little ugly? I don't know if it really got ugly because I think we were so, I don't want to say isolated, but kind of set apart from the ugliness that could arise on a set yeah. of timing because we had the, the buffer of us as a group and we worked together most of the time. And then we had Fred there in the middle was sort of a mm-hmm. buffer from the production and that kind of nuts and bolts grind of it and then us. And I remember that very vividly. And I think Fred, Fred kind of related uh, to us in that regard as a buffer, um, either very smartly yeah. um, or, or very, um, uh, you know, uh, for, uh, lucky, <laughs> yeah. you know, for us. Um, but it is a lot of work. And like I was saying, when you're dealing with kids on a set, you can only be there for so long. So there's not a lot of goof off time when you're supposed to be working. So you got to know what you're doing, know where you're yeah. going. Uh, and then we had we had a lot of night shoots, especially at yeah. the end. Yeah, uh, you know, a lot of stuff took around different locations around Southern California, um, but a lot of stuff was on stage. Mm-hmm. And you know, shooting a movie it takes a long time. You know, it's a long yeah. it's a long process, and every day is long. 
Uh, and when you actually look at like, a, especially back in the day, things are tighter today because there's less, there's less time and less money to do a day. Yeah. But, uh, you know, back in that day, like if you actually counted the minutes that you actually, quote unquote, rolled film or yeah. rolled the camera and comp- it'd be a few minutes a day. <laughs> yeah. But you're spending yeah. hours and hours and hours setting up and blocking yeah. and moving equipment and, and moving locations, moving locations and stuff. Yeah. Um, Amazing. It was super fun because you were doing a lot of, you saw a lot of cool stuff, but yeah. it was work, man. It's yeah. like, it's, it's not, it's not an adventure oh, park. Sure, it's, yeah. it's not a playland. It's and there's more pressure on you as the kids, because if you goof off, everybody's going to go, Oh, kids, kids. Yeah. Yeah, and, exactly. Um, yeah. You know, that happens. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So with that being said, was there one day on set that stood out for you? That was just like, this was, this was the day, this was a scene or that you really I, I enjoyed. Pers- yeah, I think personally, one of my favorite, some of my favorite scenes in the movie that don't have me in it, which is which is cool. Um, yeah. But for scenes that I was in, I think, I think my favorite scene is between Sean and Dell in the bathroom, like just being dad and kid. Yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of people like the roof scene, like watching the movie in the roof. That's not long enough. Like that could almost be like a 10 minute scene of people. You're right, movie, yeah. But it's so quick. But it, it means a lot, yeah. um, um, you know, kind of uh, thematically and, and, and character wise. But look, I mean, it's the, the obvious answer to your question is that that last kind of sequence, yeah. you know, when we're in town square, it's nighttime yeah. and all of this shit's happening. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. you got, yeah. you got everything in the last five minutes of this movie going on all at once. And yeah. you've got action, you've got special effects, you've got creature effects, you've got guns going off, you've got, uh, <laughs> you know, wolfmen's blowing up in the middle of air. Yeah. You know, you've got vampire brides getting staked, you know, there's wind machines going and all this junk being thrown at you. You're getting pelted in the head by fake bricks and twigs from trees and leaves. How long did that um, take he, to shoot? That was like a week. That was a week, right? That was like a week or more. And yeah. uh, all night shoots, which you got to get your stuff in and then you got to go. And then the yeah. adults stay and make movies into the wee hours. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the highlights of that were probably, um, I actually had a stunt that was cut out. Um, like when I, when I stake Dracula and he flies off of the vortex, like I'm almost getting sucked in mm-hmm. and the, the, the rest of the squad is doing like a human kind of chain and they're holding on to me. So I don't fly in there. There's a shot where I'm actually up on a rigging and I'm flying in the air and I'm almost really. a, like they're I'm flying. So they're holding on to me. Uh, I remember that cause it hurt. Uh, and um, do you know why I got it, cut? I don't know why. Maybe it just didn't look right. Or uh, yeah. we, we have a little, we have that actual uh, BTS running film footage in the documentary. So there's awesome. a little clip of that scene that we've never seen. Um, that was a little selfish insert that I made sure was in there because no one saw my big stunt. And um, <laughs> uh, I have like two minor ones in the rest of the movie. And, but that one was a big one. Hey, and you got uh, <laughs> to be proud about that. I mean, come and, on. Yeah. And I, you know, I think just all of that you know, the carnage and the melee and, yeah. you know, it took like a week or so to shoot that. And it's really only like a, a less than a 10, 10 minute sequence all the yeah. way from when it just kind of starts to, you know, the final yeah. you know, line. But it feels epic. It feels like when you watch the movie, it, is, it was, it, it's it an, was, it may I mean, have yeah. been that way to shoot, but it comes off. I think the way it was intended as an, an epic climax to a film. So it makes it worth it. Right. Yeah, it totally does. And, you know, whether it was, you know, that rigging hurt or, you know, you got really tired of getting pelted in the, in the, in the face <laughs> by these leaves or fake bricks. Cause we have these giant wind machines and they're basically yeah. um, airplane engines uh, with big propellers. And, you know, they, you know, they face the propellers the other way. So the wind is actually going so, towards yeah. you and it, and you just throw stuff in front of it, it just shoots out like a cannon. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's like foam stop signs and, you know, yeah, fake yeah. Break. I mean, it was insane. Like if you actually look at something like there's some stuff where that wind is really going Yeah. and Ashley's getting, you know, hammered in the face by leaves. And, <laughs> uh, you know, it was, it was, it was quite the ordeal, but that was also the same week that I stood behind the camera. I stayed later and I stood behind the camera and watched them, you know, blow up Wolfman with a stick of dynamite in midair. So that was kind of, that was and kind that of was my too. next question. That was, my, yes. uh, it's amazing. Um, how cool was that for you for you then i mean you were there so i mean to that effect that stunt on that day how cool was that for you i mean you knew it was going to happen you read it in the script and i can't remember in sequence or out of sequence you know because we did the we did the scene where you know, like i hit him in the head and then my dad puts the dynamite in his pants and push because who 
dynamite in the pants what a great gag yeah um you know and then you, you know, push him out the window and it blows up and it's kind of one of the, if he had stayed there sequence. we all would, we all would have blown up i mean yeah. it's literally the second time my character almost gets blown up by dynamite in a movie i mean it's insane <laughs> um yeah, the only, I do remember the only thing I, I was sitting and watching a new was a, you know, a one take. So they had multiple cameras, you know, on the ground and, um, you know, and, and, and when big stunt effects or big special effects are going, you, you hit, there's this feel before mm-hmm. cameras roll and then, and it's just that you can feel the electricity in the air. Yeah. And then all of a sudden that window burst open, this thing came out, it blew up right after. And I mean, it was pretty intense. Um, yeah, it was pretty cool. Uh, it's a yeah, great sequence. In the, it's a great sequence in the film. Um, you know, just from the <laughs> choreography of like, you know, you and your father do double teaming him and then just yeah. the, the timing of yeah. going out the window. It's a it's a very uh I wouldn't say it's underappreciated because I think the people that you know love Monster Squad really appreciate that sequence, but uh it's it, it's a good one. It's one of the it's it's up it there. Is. Sure. And it was fun to do, you know, because yeah. um and there's a funny story in that with the with the that fight scene between the dad and, and, and Wolfman, um, we, you know, when I come in to save, you know, save the day for him, <laughs> um, you know, and, and I have a bat and, yeah. you know, we, we did the rehearsal, we walked up and it was like, okay, you come up here and obviously it's camera things. You don't, I'm not really, it was a phone bat. I'm not really hitting Carl inside of the Wolfman outfit. You know, you fake it, yeah. you know, for the camera to look, but, but you got to sell it. Yeah. And even though I'm left-handed, I batted right-handed, but I had to hold it the other way. So I was halfway comfortable doing it. Oh, I see. Um, but what's funny is, you know, I grew up with this imagination and I played a lot by myself and, you know, um, you know, you go out and you play matchbox cars or army men or action figures and spaceships and you always make the sound. And, you know, <laughs> I remember we got, fr- you know, we blocked it out. We worked it out. Yeah. I said, okay, let's do it. Let's, let's shoot one. So we shot the first take of that sequence where I come up and say, Hey, asshole. And I went, hey, asshole. And Wolfman turns to me. And then, you know, it's supposed to be good timing. Like he's turning right into the blow. Yeah. And so you go, hey, and I went, hey, asshole. <laughs> <laughs> and like he reacted and the deck of the man to push him off camera. And I remember Fred calling cut. And he's like, that's great. That's good. So the timing's good. Um, we don't need the sound effect. <laughs> we'll, we'll put that in later. And I was like, what is he? he goes, you made a sound like you were hitting him. Like you, I was like, Oh shit! <laughs> I was like, as good as it was, to, how dumb of me to do that. Um, and so That's we shot reaction. another one. I kept, I, I didn't make the, <laughs> I didn't make my own special effects sounds like That's I would have been in, in in our backyard if you and I were doing a you know a fake wrestling match or a fight or something. <laughs> like I uh, actually did the. I did the kapow. It's like so that's stupid. awesome, though. How can you not? I mean, you're, you're you know, you're a kid. That's the you, that's what you do. Yeah. That, you know, I, um, I think it was maybe the you know being being caught up in the cool moment and and just going. Yeah, with it. most kids don't have like a foley department to add in the effects after, right? So like you're. Uh... That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so one like, of oh, my... I don't need to do it all. <laughs> one of my favorite scenes in the film is actually the first one. Um, and uh, I, I really think it's just, it's got like high production value with Van Helsing um like it oh it, yeah it look it's got high production it's got it looks like it was shot in like you know the carpathian mountains and oh. uh and i really think that 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 film i mean that that scene really just sends that film off on the right foot um obviously you weren't there for that you know the shooting of that but what what are your thoughts on that scene i mean i was wasn't in the scene but i was around because that was oh, on were. one of our that was one of our stages at the studio lot um and you got to see the set and and kind of watch them shoot some of the scenes, but yeah, giant set build for the inside of that castle type. Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a that's a big time set build, especially when the floor is coming up and things coming. Yeah. There's a lot going on there. Yeah, no. and um, I actually you know knew um, well I knew them all after, but I knew one of the stuntmen um, that's in that scene leading up to that. I'd known him for a number of years, and so he's in he's in you know my movie you know or we're in the same movie, which was cool. Mm-hmm. um and i had known him he's this famous stuntman that had been around for decades and he's a circus guy and he, you know his backyard was the place that we all went to rehearse for the show circus of the stars and so i i had done that once and then i did it a year after and his name's bob yerkes and he's a famous kind of high fall guy he always did high falls in movies hmm. and or just basic stunts and what was cool is he was actually a uh, you know, a, a side stunt man in, in a movie uh, called The Towering Inferno, which my sister's in. And so, you know, there's a big span of, you know, connectivity in the industry sometimes. And that's cool. Uh, you know, the other connection, I don't know if you've ever seen or anybody's Great heard film. of The Towering Inferno, but, you know, big film yeah. in the early 70s. Great film. And my sister, 
my Newman. it's a fantastic movie yeah um my sister is the little girl that uh, paul newman saves throughout the you know really? second and third act while the fires goes that's my sister that's and awesome. um what's role. cool is during the oh it's a it's a great credit for her i mean it's like that's something yeah. you can trade on for the rest of your life not only that you were in the towering inferno but you got saved by paul newman the whole paul time. newman right? and um because normally what she says she goes yeah 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 paul newman you know is like just holding me by my butt for like a month it's great <laughs> <laughs> um and uh but it's a fantastic movie with a huge cast yeah, but yeah. during some of the tricky stunt stuff um in tearing inferno my sister was doubled by uh, a little person named felix silla who is you know if you're a little person and you can add it's you, a great job doubling kids in movies mm -hmm. fast forward it wasn't even that long so you know 73 to 87 you know so 12 years or something right yeah um or if my math is terrible, that's terrible math. Um, four seniors. Um, uh, Ashley Bank at the end of Monster Squad um, is doubled by Felix Silla. And uh, so it was, that was really cool too. So that's um, pretty cool. there's, a, there's a cool tie in. Yeah, that's pretty, neat. that's pretty but, neat. But uh, yeah, you know, that whole sequence really, you know, from it just, like you said, it just, it, once it starts, it, it doesn't stop until the credits yeah. roll. And it's pretty intense. Yeah, no, it is. I, uh, I always felt bad for the girl reading. I mean, just Van Helsing's like giving her the business while she's trying to read. I don't think, I mean, I, I the would walk up on the, <laughs> who can yeah, read? Yeah, you know, that's read interesting. You... <laughs> right, and that's interesting, of course, because, you know, Ryan and I are sitting there on the set and this girl was there and, you know, she's playing, you know, some German, you know, Bavarian maiden and um, <laughs> doesn't know she's going to get sucked into the, you know, void yeah. of limbo for all yeah, eternity. It, it looks like they skipped cute, some really details. Cute kind of blonde girl. And Ryan and I were like, yeah, oh, who's this cute girl? Let's like hang out with her. And she was like, I'm not having any of that. I'm like uh, 19, <laughs> like go away from me. <laughs> and uh, we're like, oh, okay. Um, but yeah, that's a neat scene. And it, it really sets it off. And yeah, it does. What's crazy is there's some missing footage from even down in the forest, you know, and, and cause they yeah. actually, they actually stake Dracula um, and capture him. But, um, and that got yeah. cut um that's how they blow it you know in, in the crawl they, the blew end, how they blew it yeah <laughs> and um i've told that story a hundred times people are like what but you know i think shane's original draft like there was um like an invading army in the bay like in like a thousand guys get off like 20 ships and there's zeppelins oh, in the air and like in this this, this giant battle Lord of the rings like, kind of <laughs> vamp yeah like exactly like <laughs> vampire brides and like wolfen creatures and like all these freedom fighters that are like you know getting mauled in the forest and yeah. uh, then they capture dragon then they go up into the castle to read the spell but we just jump right into the castle to read the spell because yeah. i think fred jokes even jokes even in the maybe in the dock or in the somewhere else <laughs> if we had shot that sequence the way shane i think it originally wrote it that was the entire budget of the movie <laughs> yeah yeah i can <laughs> so imagine that. It was, yeah you can but that's some but, cool Shane Black brain stuff. Yeah, but you know what? Again, like, you know, uh, without knowing all that, the viewers, you know, get set off on the right foot because um, it's a pretty uh, pretty uh, action-packed scene. The clubhouse, which was, you know, every kid's dream. Um, yeah, no doubt. Was, uh, was the uh, actual exterior set deck functional? Were you able to get in there or was it uh, doubled for with the studio it, the um the, the there was a tree house in a tree that you see um, yeah that uh, gets it gets blown up yeah um but interiors were all on a, on a on a stage yeah, yeah. so um, you couldn't go into the the one on the tree it wasn't uh, you could and here's the uh i think it's i ryan and i joke i think it's safe to say nowadays um it's been long enough um <laughs> there's so i actually did a where i crawl up i climb up the tree and the extra one gets something to come out. I'm getting the die. I can't, can't remember what it was. Mm -hmm. But then there was a day where um, we were on set at that location and they needed a shot. And it was the shot of where Rudy opens the curtain to look out the window. You just yeah. need that kind of establishing shot. And I remember Ryan, Ryan tells the story because he was standing right there. So this is Ryan's tale. But uh, uh, at least... Gans was our studio teacher and this had probably been I mean you've probably been on set maybe a month or so by now and uh, yeah. you know she's your she's in charge of you like she is your protector <laughs> and advocate and den mother and you know um sheepdog and um you know terminator <laughs> you know so to speak <laughs> and uh, we're on set and we come on it's like all right uh, uh Fred, Fred was like all right what we need we need Ryan um 
you know, walking frame, uh, we need to go up in the clubhouse and we need to do the shot of you opening the curtain. And he's like, that's not happening. Like he's, there's no way. Cause it's not even like a built thing. There's yeah. no safety stuff. There's so there's like, there's no way a kid's climbing up there. And they're like, Oh, well that sucks. <laughs> um, and then somehow, uh, <laughs> like, um, five minutes later or something, they were like, Hey, Elise, look over there. Like, can we come, can we talk to you over here? And then Fred was like, Ryan, go get up there, go up there, go up there. <laughs> and so Ryan scurried up the tree as well really? and sat down and he tells us like there was a guy like a grip up there uh like holding on to his like holding on to his legs just in case like I mean yeah, it wasn't yeah. rickety it was pretty sturdy because I was up there too once but uh he had to do the shot open the window and then get back down before Elise yeah. had the news so sorry That's Elise I think they pulled one over on you but yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> the um were you all in love with uh Lisa Fuller I mean, who then or now? I mean, geez. Uh, if you've seen the documentary, I mean, we got her yeah. in the documentary, which is fabulous because uh, she's been kind of enjoying the Monster Squad resurgent ride, awesome. you know, for the Good last for twelve years on the, you know, on the on the on the periphery. Yeah, and she'll chime in, be like, "Oh my god, that looks so much fun!" I was like, "Why are you not here at this? Thing? Like, come to the screening. Come to this. Come." She's like, ah. "Yeah." Uh, and then I actually uh, flew her to Fantastic Fest uh, in 2017 because nice. uh, we were doing a big event and I actually rebuilt kind of the the tree house in the bar at the Alamo Draft House. And we That's had cool. the, the poster and uh, uh, my friends, Jason Murphy and his wife, uh, like Allison Murphy, knocked it out of the park, like recreate, like built walls and she built a fake tree and then had all this production stuff that uh, you don't see in the documentary. Yeah. Um, because we cut that scene out. It's now a special feature that will hopefully be on the international release. Nice. Uh, but we had, we, I brought the cast to Austin and, and we showed a little teaser cut of the doc at this big film festival called Fantastic Fest. And um, we brought Lisa and she was like, oh my God, this is so much fun. And that was the first time anybody had seen Patrick's sister in yeah. you know, 30 years. And it was awesome. And she's just as gorgeous as she is yeah. in the movie as she is today. And, you know, then she came to our studio set and sat down and gave an interview. And, uh, you great. know, she's been married to uh, Dan Gautier, who's an actor as well for forever. Yeah, yeah. Um, shortly, not too long after Monster Squad. But right. these two, they're like the ones that are, it's such the annoying kind of, you know, good looking, gorgeous beautiful nah. human being actor couple and you're like oh, you just want to strangle people yeah, and, yeah. Uh, but dan's a super cool dude and he was on a great show called tour of duty and he's done a ton of work too yeah and, uh, they're they're just awesome people i'm, I'm glad we reconnected over the last so let, let's stop talking about them then because it's, uh, <laughs> yeah let's, let's let's get back to the let's get back to the you know yeah the, the, the ugliness people like of, me uh... and you yeah that's right <laughs> All right. All right. So uh, speaking, okay, a good little segue here. I want to talk about uh, the the monsters and uh, hmm. and the makeup. Uh, you had some geniuses on set for this. Now, um, I'm to understanding that um, you know Universal did not give permission for rights to the um, the images of your monsters. Is that correct? It's it's basically correct. Yeah. So yeah. at the time, obviously likenesses of things like Dracula mm -hmm. and Frankenstein's monster um, were those characters are in public domain because they were old enough. Um, Creature yeah. from Black Lagoon obviously was a fairly new movie. They own that likeness. Uh, yeah. And that's why Gilman looks differently. But I think that was part of the yeah. success of the, our creature builds. Mm -hmm. uh, the Frankenstein change and the Gilman change, it wasn't so much as they didn't they, they said no, but they were still protected in um, protected likenesses because they were using them at the theme parks. Yeah. Okay. And so you couldn't recreate the original uh, uh, Jack Pierce designs. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which, if you know, if you talk to all the kind of creature guys that were, you know, the crew and the team that made our monsters, they were like, "Yeah, we're this is amazing. We get to do the famous monsters." And they're like, "No, you can't. You got to change it." Yeah. And they were they were sort of disappointed. But I think that was probably the best thing that ever happened to the movie in respect to the creature builds is because mm -hmm. these young guys who were all young newbies in the yeah. business working for Stan Winston, Stan Winston. fairly new as well. Yeah. Um, they all had to re they had to reimagine things that everybody knows what they look like Yeah, and do them in a cool way. And I think that's what made the difference. Yeah, uh, you know, all the way down from I, I think the Frankenstein uh, Tom Woodruff 
and Stan designed uh, Tom Woodruff Juber and uh, Alec Guinness designed um, Frankenstein's Monsters makeup, you know, Tom mm-hmm. Newman wore. And I, I thought it was interesting because, you know, the original one has the bolts in the neck and ours have it in the head. I was like, well, if you're going to reanimate dead brain tissue, why wouldn't they be on the head? I was yeah. like, this is even smarter. Like the original <laughs> one's dumb. Um, and you, you got rid of kind of the squared forehead and yeah. it looked more kind of human, you know, yeah. like walking, yeah. like, walk, you know, the living dead walking yeah, human yeah. corpse around. Um, but look, I mean, the high, everybody discount, like no one ever really pays attention to Shane Mahan's mummy build, but that is amazing. No, and, I, I will. I will pay attention to it. it I will pay it, attention it is, to it. It is fantastic. And we go into that a little bit in, in yeah. the documentary. And, um, but you know, the highlight of everything is, is people love Wolfman and then the Gilman suit. Everybody loves the creature yeah. suit because it, uh, it really was the first time that anybody built a suit in that manner, which yeah. All of these monsters, and including Gilman, I think, person literally changed the game. It was yeah. the huge paradigm shift and flipped the switch uh, that affected the industry going forward uh, to this day. That's to this awesome. day, yeah. So yeah. I do want to. Uh, so as a kid, you know, and um, you know, I'm watching this film, and I'm a huge Universal Monsters fan. So, you know, I got really really and as a kid you don't understand rights and legal and all that kind of stuff you just understand that that's not frankenstein frankenstein doesn't look like that that doesn't right so monster squad comes around and while you couldn't imitate them exactly i think that you know the the innovations to the designs were unbelievable and i find to me that's the best frankenstein monster design since the original and since then, there hasn't been one, in my opinion, that has kind of brought that that lore from the 30s, yet modernized it. Like, I thought that the Frankenstein monster in that film, the design and the makeup, the reason why I like it so much is because it's, so, um, it's so honest to the original, yet... Looks different. It, yeah. Looks different. And, and, and it all went perfectly as far as i'm concerned there hasn't been one better since since monster squad and i actually kind of feel the same way with the wolfman at the time i was like wow what a unique design for a wolfman that that looked different like you know he looks like more of a man but he actually looks more of a wolf than ever before too like you know like and, and i thought they were two of the obvious ones but and i do want to talk about the mummy I don't want to like throw these all at you right now, but I personally loved the look of that mummy so much, but I was heartbroken at how little it was used in the film. Yeah. That guts me because it was so cool looking. Yeah. And it was, um, yeah, he doesn't get enough screen time. Um, And I think the mummy was all there just to have the gag one of being in Eugene's closet. Mm-hmm. And then two, um, getting unraveled because I thought that was a cool like death. It was, um, yeah. Th- and and the effect of it, like the idea was cool, but the mm-hmm. effect looked really good. Mm-hmm. And yeah. but yeah, no, there's there's good stories with uh, if we're talking about mummy, you know, like Shane Mahan, who you know was working with Stan, and he and John Rosengrand are now co-owners of. Um, is it legendary? um their their um stan's company or their own company they have like the biggest creature effects and and, and build company out there now uh tom AD. woodruff jr and alec guinness work together at uh, amalgamated dynamics studio adi i mean these are all icons of the industry now and they were just young 20 somethings yeah you know during yeah, Monsters. Know, so this is really cool to see how yeah. they go and steve wang and matt rose you know they you know they had steve shop it's awesome yeah. to to hang out with these guys now and and, and celebrate with them uh, the mummy, yeah, it was like, I mean, Shane talks about kind of the concept uh, in, in the documentary of their idea of what it was, because usually there's always this big lumbering mummy, and it's like, yeah. actually, if you know what mummies are, they're actually kind of small. Mm. Uh, so we went with a small mummy, and then Fred, you know, held this casting around, saw Michael McKay, who was this, you know, small, really thin, still is, yeah. you know, character actor, uh, and came in and said, walked like a mummy and fred was like you're it <laughs> and you know so we got to hang out with you know those guys yeah. that made these effects um at, at a distance because yeah. they were working yeah. and then you know these guys that were in the suit but the wolfman suit's a great story behind that because john rosengrant um you know they kind of took a little bit from all of the great 
Wolfmans of the past, yeah. like yeah. Jack Pierce and Hammer style, and, yeah. and they, yeah. they put the white shirt on. And they they kind of put a little of that touch to it, a little of the gray hair, um, and then the facial expression. The there was an original sketch, and so the Wolfman kind of helmet, you know, the face actually is kind of a a caricature of Stan Winston himself, supposedly. Yeah. So that's kind of a little thing, but that's all practical kind of creature builds on Wolfman. And like when his face is moving and growling, that's all like the, the football helmet with the stuff on it and the wires and they're underneath Carl Tybalt, who's the guy in the suit, you know, mm-hmm. moving the wires and moving the lips and the tongue and the, and the, and the ears. Uh, I, it's, I mean, I don't know. How, I don't know how they do that. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's a lot of tedious work. I mean, you, yeah. you have to be an artist and a technical wizard at the same time. Yeah. And um, usually someone can only do one of those. And these guys yeah. do both sides. Um, yeah. And, you know, to, to, to see, and, and, the, and the Gilman's a whole other thing. That's a, yeah. I mean, we, we chronicle that whole kind of process in the doc more than the others, just because it was a groundbreaking type of thing. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's a one piece latex suit. Yeah. And Tom Woodruff Jr. is actually in the suit. He built Frankenstein's makeups, but then also was in the suit for Gilman for the first time. And then that launched a career as him as a, as a creature performer. Hmm. And he gets glued into that. He literally gets zipped up and glued into that bodysuit. And then the helmet goes on, glued in. And the hands are, they're all, he's super glued in the suit and you can't get out until the end of the day. Like you don't leave. Yeah. And there's no, there's no zipper anywhere. Yeah. (laughs) And, um, and and the paint scheme, it just really is a a unique creature build and they invented it. Like Matt Rose and and Steve Wang, like they invented that suit and how to make that suit. Yeah. Like for that. And like, and and that affected how you make suits to this day. That's amazing. And yeah, no, I, I mean, you know, there was, it, it looked like there was no expense spared for the monsters of this film, which was a good call, <laughs> you know, but uh, um, yeah, you, that's not where you want to skimp. No, uh, no, but it does happen, only, right? It, it happens a lot. Yeah. Um, I mean, look, I mean, a, a perfect example is, and if you do skimp or don't have the right thing, stop and, and revise. Yeah. And this is all in the same year you know, everybody knows the original Predator story of, you know, Jean-Claude Van Damme running yeah. around in the red chick, red space chicken suit. It was just terrible. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and the locale looked bad. The creature looked bad. Like this is, this movie sucks. Yeah. And it was, I, I think as the story goes, Schwarzenegger was like, Hey, you know, we, uh, we just worked with these guys on Terminator. They're pretty, uh, they're pretty inventive. Like why don't <laughs> we give them a crack at, at making this alien. And I always feel a tie-in, not just because it was Stan and his guys that did Predator, but if you look at Predator and you look at Steve Wang's Gill Man, mm-hmm. the paint scheme and the body style, it's all its all very similar of this kind of organic, yeah. amphibious kind of creature. Uh, and Steve tells the stories of, you know, how, you know, how, how they came up with that. That's awesome. So I, li- I like the tie-in to an awesome movie. Not just that Shane Black was also in <laughs> and a ghostwriter on Predator, but, you know, with the creature effects too. So oh, if Predator. I can be tied into Predator, that's rad. Predator, yeah, yeah, I love that movie. And same, same year, right? Eighty seven. Yeah, yeah. Um, so were uh, were you guys freaked out? Were any of the kids freaked out with these monsters on set, or were you guys kind of did they diffuse it a little bit uh, with uh, you know kind well, of prepping? Yeah, it was almost a little of the opposite because yeah. you know a lot of people know the story that uh, both Tom Noonan and Duncan Regeer are you know super talented uh, uh method trained yeah. actors yeah and they both approached it like tom did it on a different level he's like i'm i never want to be seen out of makeup and i'll never be out of character i will yeah. always be frankenstein's monster and then duncan took it the same way and then also said i don't and and, and planned it with fred and and the producers mm-hmm. of like i don't i don't want to be around the kids as duncan i just only want to be dracula and so I don't want to be seen out of costume. I don't want to be seen out of makeup. And I pro- and so when you see me, I'm on set, I'm Dracula and I'm gone. And I think. Isn't that kind know, of that genius for, for an adult well, actor it, to it, say, it, hey, it, I don't want to. Certainly, yeah, it's, it's a good thing. It's, cre- <laughs> it's a good way to not be around kids. To not right? hang around the kids. It's like um, it's just character. It's all but character. what it does is it, 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 it lends that authenticity of. Yeah because these kids aren't friends with these monsters. Like we shouldn't pal around no, and be comfortable no. with them. Anytime they're around us, we should be absolutely terrified. Yeah. Uh, and then when you get something, you know, like a, a six and a five-year-old or something, around, you know, yeah. Ashley knocked it out of the park, but she did not like Duncan 
when he had his fangs and or yeah. his red contacts like she was okay i believe just right but when and that's the whole scream sequence you know when, yeah. when he calls when he says give me the amulet you bitch and then hisses at her that was yeah. that was that was real terror genuine and um you know she tells that story and we chronicle it and that it's it's a fascinating mm-hmm. story uh and everybody laughs at it now but um, it was probably uh it was probably a wardrobe change for little Lash back <laughs> there for a, for for a quick minute, but you know it was those guys like M- Michael McKay as the mummy was different. Carl as Wolfman was different. Like we saw them out of costume, like we yeah. ate with them. You know, I remember feeding like Michael through his face mask because he couldn't see yeah. or chew, and so and then like Michael Faustino, I think just walked around with with Michael all the time. Oh, really? And like made sure he didn't bump into things or yeah. you know pick up his trailing like he would carry his trailing bandage or something and so it doesn't get dirty. And um but you know that's kind of interesting to see a six year old that's an actor in a movie kind of befriend one of the monsters yeah, and take funny. care of like he's his pet. You know, and like don't you know walk don't or like <laughs> it's like his old grandpa or either his like <laughs> yeah. new, his new grandpa or his old puppy or something, right? And um that's pretty cool. It, it, so that was that was neat to remember that that went down but uh yeah That's you know for, for me and the other guy like we knew who they were it, you know you just you, you kind of go through it but we never hung out with duncan and we never saw yeah. tom out of makeup or out of character i i think it's a, a genius uh a genius ploy on a on an actor just to not have to deal with kids on to, set, to deal but... with the kids and, <laughs> and have to like have small talk at lunch yeah yeah, yeah um yeah. who knows man <laughs> i'll pull that off next time someone yeah, yeah. <laughs> um so overall though like i think monster squad is not only um you know you know a great fun film but it's it's a really and it's a really good looking film it's a nice clean bright when it needs to be dark creepy it's got it's cinematically i really really love this movie and and that's something that maybe you know it's it's a little filmy on my end to look at but i really think this film just is a gorgeous looking film well you're 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 bringing up something that a lot of people enjoy without knowing they enjoy it Mm -hmm. uh, without diving into why yeah and this movie is very cinematic it's uh, it's got great production design it's got great production value yeah um i mean sound score effects sound those are all awesome too but just the visuals of this movie when you look at it from the the pun you know from that lens only yeah uh it it really there's some good stuff in there and it starts with kind of the storyboarding and what the camera should be like and i think that's one area that i think uh, Fred and the production and us as a cast were really fortunate to have mm-hmm. our DP, who was Bradford May, mm-hmm. who's a who's a very very inventive, creative, cinematic DP. Yeah, and sort of ended up over the years having you know like a Bradford May kind of look and a style. Yeah, and he's still a great guy. Like uh, we, I mean, before you know, kind of pandemic time, like we just went to dinner. Yeah, because um, his family is is this industry kind of icon production family. Like yeah. his uh, his uncle is uh, Tommy Chainsaw May, and Tommy's <laughs> son Michael. And Tommy was um, you know is this famous key grip, and he was our key grip for Monster Squad. And Michael, Tommy's son, was our second AC. And Michael is now a big DP, makes movies and TV shows, um, and and we all kind of stay in touch. Um, and but. But Bradford May's kind of camera work and setup and and the, it, you don't pay unless you know this stuff mm-hmm. you because mm-hmm. that's what's good about good movie you don't realize what's getting done yeah. to you you know yeah. without going oh my god I don't realize that this was a this tracking shot went that long and and then it rose up and came down and it's mm-hmm. ominous and it's coming and you know uh, oppressing this character you know with yeah. the lens uh, until you get into kind of nerdy cinema stuff like that right. Yeah. Um, and, and you know it's fascinating everybody calls like the Spielbergness of of a movie it's all this camera work and the blocking and it's fascinating to watch that stuff because he really does do stuff that no one else does yeah. but you don't realize it when you're watching a Spielberg movie mm-hmm. same thing kind of with Monster Squad and this camera work and the setup and the way everything came together because it's cinematic with the costumes with the monsters with the effects that's going on but it's that basic of how you're going to tell the story through yeah. this camera work and I give all the credit to to Bradford May on that. Yeah, well, it's uh, um, yeah, I wasn't lost uh, on a lot, I'm sure a lot of people, but uh, definitely something that I've appreciated over the years. Uh, I'm kind of curious. I was going to ask you back, back when we were talking about the audition process. So you you auditioned for a lot of things. What what were some of the ones that got away? 
ah, we don't have enough time. Um, <laughs> you know, that's everything. Like I said, when you're of that age and I think, you know, everybody's going to read for everything. And yeah. if you're lucky, you get a call back or a screen test and you get really close. Was there one um, that? Probably in hindsight. And, and it was it was disappointing even before you saw what the movie became or the movies became. But there's probably, I mean, there's dozens and dozens. Yeah. But there's probably two in in feature films that stand out for me, and one is uh, Dead Poet Society. Oh. And they ended up going with um, everybody that was kind of either fairly new or all from the East Coast, I believe. And yeah. and probably rightly so because it was a northeast private school you know yeah. some like laid back california kid like me going hey <laughs> um carpe diem dude yeah <laughs> um i would have tried you know i tried to be as preppy and 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 stoic as i as i could uh, yeah. in the audition process but that was a peter weir movie and for some reason uh peter weir um i read for peter weir would i read for every peter weir movie and I couldn't do Mosquito Coast because I was I had a commitment with the TV show one time, I think. And mm. um, that would have been cool. But kind of the, the number one answer to your question is uh, Stand By Me. Yeah. Wow. And um, I remember reading, I remember those auditions and I, uh, I read for uh, Teddy Duchamp. And, oh, yeah. but uh, there's a reason that Corey got Teddy Duchamp because he brought you know, that's what happens in auditions. So like you brought in and you become, you know, you hit that button for the people making yeah. the decisions. Yeah. And uh, Corey brought that a little bit of that damaged kind of crazed, but enthusiastic kid yeah. uh, look like he always does to everything. Cause Corey's actually a pretty good actor. Yeah. Uh, and if you watch some of his stuff, then when you start getting older teenage years, it gets a little campy and weird, but yeah, you know, he's, he's actually, when he was a kid, he was, he was a pretty good performer. Um, yeah, you bought you bought the stuff that he was you know selling yeah. for sure. Like, a lot, a lot of times as kids, it's different now, thankfully. But I look back at some of our younger stuff that I did and my friends did. You know, it's a little cringeworthy because you used to be a kid. It's like you're always a bundle of energy, and you're always like kind of overzealous with things, and uh, you know all this kid energy mm-hmm. that I got. Yeah, yeah. um, which you you're supposed to have in television and on commercials. Uh, it doesn't really translate great on to film. Yeah. Um, but uh, Corey was. It was great in Stand By Me. All four, all four of the kids are fantastic yeah, in Stand I mean, By Me. Uh, it's, a, it's a great cast. Yeah, it's I, great just, cast. I, I just want to be in that movie as a selfish move, not to be in a big movie, but because that's one of my favorite movies. It's actually uh, my second favorite kids adventure movie of the 80s. <laughs> and it's like, I was almost, I was like, oh yeah, man, I wish I was, I wish I had done that one. But we all have those stories. Like exactly. a lot of people have stories of not being in Monster Squad. <laughs> well, hey, you know what? I was just about to say, I don't think there's very many Stand By Me conventions out there. So, you know, score one. Well, there should you. be though, because it's such a good It is a great film, but it just doesn't lend itself the same way. But... You know, what's funny is all those kids, Sands River, of course, because he's mm-hmm. gone, but uh, all all the, the three are all at conventions for other stuff. Not Stand Yeah, I, yeah, that's true. Because uh, Corey, <laughs> I mean, my gosh. And then, yeah, Will Wheaton, uh, the, the Star Trek. Yeah. and yeah. yeah. So, okay. So I want to talk about uh, Fred Decker, who is the, mm. the captain, oh, my captain of this film. And... Uh, and what was it like working with him at that age? Now I put aside, you know, your relationships with him now when you're doing all the retrospect, but as a kid, what was he like as a director? Um, you know, I think what was great about the experience was, you know, sort of mentioned it earlier, Fred was sort of this, we were the con, like he was the contact to the production for us. Like everything mm-hmm. went through him. Yeah. And he was almost sort of that buffer, that shield to everything else. But he was also involved and inside of our circle to to make sure that he was getting what he wanted or needed or what we should be doing. Uh, But also it wasn't like this kind of heavy handed authoritarian figure, you know, barking out commands. Uh, It was it was was a nice blend of of coaxing out what was needed, what was wanted and what should be done, I think. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, you know, I mentioned it briefly, but, um, you know, Ryan was 14. I was 13 when we shot this movie. Uh, Fred was like 25. I think, yeah. Or something. yeah. So it was 24 or 25. It's not that far removed. Far removed, no. So it's not like you have like, you know, 
you're not up there with some old studio director from the fifties. Yeah. That's like, you know, exactly. 65 yeah. trying to relate to kids of the day. And yeah. Fred's just a kid at heart. He still yeah. is. I mean, yeah. you know, brain full of information and knowledge and historical yeah. facts and movie lore. Um, and that would kind of ooze out of him and, and try to, you know, we tried to absorb it by osmosis, yeah. I think, cool. but I, you know, and, and we have some, we have some neat, we have some neat BTS stuff that no one's ever seen in the doc um, yeah. that was shot on set of Fred directing us. And uh, there's oh, cool. one great moment with him and Ashley um, that he's just kind of right there in her ear and, and relating to what she wants. And he goes, okay, that's yeah. great. Let's do it. Um, you know, which is, is different and contrarian to his actual sit down interview in the documentary. So that's neat to see that and remember, you know, kind of yeah. remember those feels and those conversations and, and what Fred wanted because he was super enthusiastic because he's, he's a young kid. I mean, he's 25. I would have loved to have made three studio movies by the time I was 26 or 27. Right. Like yeah. Fred did. I mean, he, direct, he directed three big studio movies by that time yeah, and, uh, you know, and still have this enthusiasm and want to work with kids. Yeah. And, uh, and and know how to relate to them and, and kind of bring that that feel in there. So um, that's cool. Uh, I, I, you know, there was, I don't, there was, there was no like bad days or no animosity or no like, I don't like this guy. Um, yeah, yeah. He probably yeah. maybe have had a day or two where it's like, I can't believe we cast this kid, this kid yeah. in the ass. <laughs> uh, I have no idea. I don't know what went on yeah. in other conversations, but I don't think there was any time where I got together with myself or with the other kids and was like, God, yeah. that guy's an ass. Um, he was always right there as just part of as part of the part of the group. That's cool. Well, it's funny because you you know when you're 13, you look at a 25 year old, they look like you know they are way out there. But when you're 25, oh, yeah. and I mean you, once you hit 25, you're probably like you know 13 seems like two weeks ago. <laughs> like you know you feel it, it, like you're, right. <laughs> so you know that was his perspective. So it's kind of good that he was able to relate with you guys. Yeah. Uh, were you able to uh, were you able to go up to him and say? you know what I envisioned for this scene? I, you know, were you able to give him some feedback some, or was he accepting of it or was you know, it just, I, I think most of the time as a kid, uh, depending on where you are, um, you, you don't try to change much, but you, 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 you will kind of bend things to make them sound right coming out of your mouth or the way you walk or how you'd move. Mm -hmm. And I think that's fine. Um, and I think it's always a good way there's a collaboration, whether it's a director or a writer or a producer to say, are, you know, what are you, this is how it's supposed to be. Do you, do you think that works? Do you feel comfortable? Is there a different way? Um, and I think those, I think good directors have it in mind of what they want to see, mm -hmm. but then smart ones will always be like, okay, let's try it that way. And then like, do you have another take? Is there another way? Cause it may be better. I just may be blocked off from seeing that. So give it a go. And you know, I always have the decision. I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with my idea, you know, later. Yeah. Um, not too much of it. Cause you're just there kind of, you know, trying to rip yeah. out all of this stuff and just be you and get the lines right and, and, and get done with the day. You know, the, the, thankfully, um, the one, the one story that I didn't realize what it was at the time until just a few years ago, after hearing, um, uh, Ryan Lambert tell an anecdote from his days on set. Um, and I'll start with his real quick, you know, just real quick as the setup, it's, um, Ryan, like we, we're just starting, like we haven't shot yet and we're going to wardrobe and work with the costume wearer and get fitted. And they're in the, the, the costume shop, uh, the, you know, the office. And she has like a rack of leather jackets that Ryan's got to try on and make sure they fit or which one's going to be Rudy's jacket. And um, it was like the third jacket. This is Ryan's story. This is Ryan's yeah. story, but uh, I know it. And um, it's like the third or fourth it puts on. And she's like, oh, I think that's it. That, that one looks good. I think that's it. And Ryan being Ryan, and, you know, us being, and Ryan says, no, I don't know. I don't think, so. I don't think this just doesn't feel comfortable. Like I would never wear this jacket. I don't think I would wear this jacket. And it took him, you know, it, it, he learned it in the moment. And then I realized that I had a similar experience and the costumer looked at him and said, that's okay, dear, because you're not playing you. <laughs> just because Ryan Lambert wouldn't wear this jacket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rudy Halloran would, and this is the jacket. Yeah. And, you know, we always celebrate. It's like, well, we glad we took that jacket because that jacket was kind of, yeah. I mean, that, that <laughs> hit a, hit a, hit a nerve with everybody that saw it. Everybody yeah. wanted that jacket. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, you know, fast forward many years later and I realized, you know, kind of finally getting around to your question, you know, working with Fred, um, I, you know, we're shooting the scene on the stage of 
Wolfman jumps out in the house and I say, kick him in the nards, mm -hmm. uh, which I had never seen or heard that word ever. Nah. <laughs> I I'd never heard the word nards. No, I didn't say it. I'd never seen it. And I wouldn't say it like, that's just not my word. Yeah. Like, and I asked, this is the one I, one time I, I asked, I was like, Hey man, I don't, um, like, can we, like, I don't know what this word is. And it's like, it seems like it was written by a guy that, you know, doesn't know kids. <laughs> like, like it was, it almost seemed like we were turning that around and going, yeah. like, I don't know whose line this is, whether you yeah. or Shane, it's like, no, no one says this word, dude. Like no one, this isn't a word. And what I was like, can I change it? Can I just say like nuts? Cause that's funny to me. Like I yeah. say nuts, like I kick him in the nuts. Yeah. That would yeah. be funny. And everybody would understand. It would be funny. Yeah. Um, and I remember Fred's response. He said, uh, he goes, I tell you what, why don't we, why don't we try it as is and go from there? And we did it a couple of times. And, you know, I, I think what Fred was doing was wanting it the way it was on the page and then moving on. Yeah. And what I, what I only think and realize years and years later was that I was having that jacket moment, but I didn't know it. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I said, I don't, I, I feel lame saying this word. I've never yeah. heard it. I don't like, no one knows what this is and what Fred deftly, you know, handled and maneuvered through that moment was that's okay because you're not saying this line. Yeah. Sean Crenshaw saying this line. Yeah. And, and, and Ryan, his epiphany is like, oh, I understand what movies are about now. <laughs> and it took me a lot longer to realize yeah. that I think I had a very similar moment like that. And, but, but Fred kind of definitely maneuvered through that without telling me no. Um, it does. And it does have an aristocratic like nards. Like you know, I, I do. <laughs> if you look at it that way, yeah. Coming to nards. Uh, but who? But you know, luckily, it. I. I didn't. You know, well, I'm not saying that, and I yeah. want to change it. Yeah. Lame. It just. Uh, felt but I listened to the person I was supposed to listen to, and he said, "Well, let's 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 keep it on the page for now, and and then see how it goes, yeah. and, and we'll move on." And then we ended up moving on. We never came back to it. <laughs> um, and luckily, because. I mean, my most sought after autograph is kick him in the nards on yeah. Greg Hour. And uh, luckily that led, because if I had changed it to nuts, Horace's line would have been Wolfman's got nuts. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that doesn't work as well. And like then that. luckily you fast forward, you know, just the last couple of years and I don't get to have, you know, probably the world's best title to a documentary. <laughs> Yeah, I know. No, it's it's amazing. <laughs> because it became eh? such an iconic line that Horace sure. delivers. Uh, even though I say Nards first in the movie, that gets for you know that gets yeah, almost yeah. forgotten and overshadowed because Brent has that uh, well, great that, <laughs> the revelation, right? <laughs> and it's and it's just such this moment that shouldn't happen in that moment, and then we run for our lives. But awesome. uh, it became so iconic, and 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 luckily because, like I said, you know we've got uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know we we got to, no one else. No one else is gonna ever title of a documentary this so no you you own that hashtag it's <laughs> safe to say um so i want to talk about some of the cast now uh um robbie kiger who played patrick um he was on uh the thing with two heads podcast channel and he's been mia for a lot of the post the post monster squad love affair yeah have you have you seen the video uh, where he apologizes uh, seen, to you? I've seen a little something of yeah of of re it's recent. Yes. Right. Yeah. I think yeah. Sean Clark did that. Yeah. yeah. He actually called me and sent that to me, and, and I watched it. Um, yeah. And I don't, uh, you know, none of us had even not only not talked to or corresponded in any way with Robbie for yeah twenty years or or, or more. Yeah. Uh, because uh, you know it was timing after the movie. Uh, like I graduated high school and then I went to college and I wasn't anywhere near, you know, LA or Hollywood for, you know, almost a, you know, a decade or so. And then Ryan was off in San Francisco being in bands and, you know, being cool yeah. and um, you know, as usual. And, you know, I'm off being a geek in college and playing basketball in college and then working at newspapers and stuff. And um, you know, none of this monster squad stuff was happening. And then even when the monster squad stuff did start happening in 06, 07 um, it was really sort of me, Ryan, Ashley, sometimes Fred. And that's all anybody had any contact with. Brent had passed away. Yeah. Um, 
Michael Faustino was in LA and working on the other side of the business. Like he's a, he's a sound engineer. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know what, we would hit him up and be like, Hey man, do, are you, do you want to be a part of these things? And yeah. that was just his decision. Like he's always working. He's very busy and he's got a family. And then it's just not really, you know, his kind of um, his, uh, his interest at the time, you know, to be involved in that stuff. So mm-hmm. that's, because he got out of acting, you know, at, at the young age of like 13 or 14 yeah. <laughs> and um, something like that. And uh, it just, that's totally fine. If it's not your interest, it's not your interest. Yeah. Um, and I love watching the shows he works on. And I, you know, we follow each other on Facebook and, and mm-hmm. give each other, a, you know, a thumbs up every, every now and then. And, um, but Rob, like we, no one knew where Robbie was. Yeah. And well, there's not even a picture of him he, on the internet. Like, like no, and so squad. so that says something, right? Yeah. You know, when someone doesn't have a photo on the internet, so, you know what's yeah. going on, and um, it's not. I don't even know most of the history or the story. That's yeah. Robbie's story to tell. Yeah. Um, but I, I do know for a, uh, you know, we heard over a number of years, like he was living in Hawaii for a, no, a long time, and then had moved back down to like you know Southern California, down by San Diego area. I think uh, we reached out once or twice. Um, I, I think I had my researcher reach out and then I reached out, out once uh, during production of the documentary. So you did uh, reach out. It, yeah. And, and either didn't hear back or didn't have a thing. And it was, you know, it was, but I, I don't know if he thinks like there was this like animosity or like a thing. Cause I was like, we didn't know where anybody, like we never saw you. Like we didn't know where yeah. Robbie was. And the, you know, then you have, you know, people that have known him or like, no, oh, I saw him and he's doing this or he's, you know, doing that. And we just never cross paths. And, you know, when you're busy doing other stuff, it's just not the thing you hunt down. But we, I, I had the researcher and I think myself and the only contact was, but it was spotty, even like on Facebook back in the yeah. day, this is, you know, a long, uh, you know, a number of years ago. Um, I think he's in a different place right now, uh, whether it's good or bad. I mean, I hope it, I hope it's getting better. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just, I just don't know the story. Like I just, yeah. I, you know, cause none of us has seen him, but do you, and, feel, you know, do you feel that, um, an apology was owed to you? Cause he seems to really, I, I don't think so. I mean, I'd have to, I mean, I, I don't know if he's a poly, like who is he apologizing to? I don't think he owes well, me an apology. For he said he, right. his story, um, was, um, the, uh, I have a video. Do you want to see the video? I've seen it. You're talking about like being at a, at a party at or something. Party, and, yeah. 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 And like, here's so, the thing. Like, I <laughs> don't actually really remember that. <laughs> really? So I'd okay. have to either ask other people, but it doesn't yeah. mean it didn't happen. I'm not calling, I'm not saying he's making stuff up. That's not what no, I'm No, you just, yeah. I just don't really recall what the context or the issue was. And I would never hold, even if it was a thing, mm-hmm. like what were we? I don't even, 15 or 16. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Like, would we hold that? you know, for that long, I certainly didn't, even if it was a thing at the time. And I honestly haven't, because I don't remember it, Um, you know, all that well, even if I was aware at the time, the fact that he is mentioning and saying means that he's held on to that for a while. And I wish that wasn't the case for sure. I mean, because if this something is, if this, if this is something, you know, negative in his mind, you know, to, to our experience or, you know, our connection, then I don't want that. No. Um, yeah. but, uh, you know, Sean, who I think took, you know, took that video, uh, you know, reached out and was like, Hey man, I just talked to Robbie and, you know, leave me a heads up and I'll, you know, check out this link and, and watch yeah, it. And I was like, yeah. I don't like, I, I don't even care about whatever happened that like, we don't remember. Yeah, yeah. He feels he owes anybody apology. I don't think he owes me one at all. Yeah. Um, and I, even if it did, I don't care. I just want Robbie to be well. I want yeah. him to you know, uh, be healthy or safe or, you know, whatever a situation is, I, none of that other, whatever it is, doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I think it would have been great over, you know, the last, you know, number of years for fans to, you know, to see Robbie or see Patrick. Um, I think there's been some examples or some experience where people have gotten to see him every once in a while, which is great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's, it's his choice, whether he wants to be a, a, what, what he wants to do. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and speaking of, you know, with cast, you know, people that interact with characters, it's, you know, the, we have the worst case scenario of something where, you know, you have this resurgence of this fandom with this movie, yeah. you know, that's now going on. Holy crap. It's almost 15 years now. <laughs> um, and 
everybody's favorite character is gone and you don't yeah. get to you know these fans don't yeah. get to see brent yeah and yeah. what what's what's worse than that is brent doesn't get to experience what's going on now yeah, yeah, yeah. um and that that's just so tragic mm -hmm. um and and i think that's sort of been on the it's always on the front of everybody's mind when we're doing something and, and everybody asks about brent and we're just like you know god this sucks <laughs> yeah um and so it you know it's i would i would you know i i i would change i wouldn't change anything that went down in the last 15 yeah. years or so except for that uh brent is still around to revel in this because I don't know. I could be selfish and say we don't want Brent around because all of the attention would go to yeah. Brent as Horace because he is everybody's favorite, yeah. uh, and and rightly so. Um, so what we would do is just sit around in the periphery and bask in the glow of Horace. Mm -hmm. And um, and but it, it, you know it'd be nice for you know if Robbie was interested or, or wanted to enjoy it, you know in in that stuff. Uh, but it's, it's a personal it's a personal yeah. choice or a personal thing for them, uh, for him and just like Michael. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's just like all of us, like, yeah, you know, there's, sure. I embrace it. I enjoy it. I don't do everything I get asked to do. Ryan yeah. doesn't do everything he gets asked to do. Um, and Ashley doesn't do everything. You know, we, we try to strategize and, 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 you know, get some good, you know, bang for the buck, so to speak, um, mm -hmm. out of the events we do get to go to or, or what we do there. Cause we've been to some amazing ones and we've been yeah. to some more like, Meh. Yeah. but, um, yeah. you know, it's all, you just got to take it as, you know, live in the moment. It's an experience and, to talk about those stories with each other, you know, going on, God, it was 2006. So that's 15, almost 15 years wow. to the day when we had that first cast reunion screen. When was, uh, when was the last time you, uh, you saw Brent? Was it uh, at the, in Monster Squad? Like, was it? Or no, no, no. It was probably, it, it was either probably like hanging out or going to lunch or something when we were older teenagers or it might have been something like at my uh, 18th birthday or something. Yeah. Okay. So you did, um, did connect yeah, with them. Yeah. I mean, you know, when you're friends like that, like one thing that my family always did, because my sisters are a little bit older, the one that's in town, they're six years older than I am. We always had really good birthday parties, um, either at like a location or at the house or something. And I'm sure it was, I'm sure he went to 16 and 18, because um, that was right before I went off to college and mm -hmm. Brent would have been in high school. And I don't know if that was the last time or like if we like hung out and went to lunch or something. Yeah, yeah. Because I was driving. He might have just been driving or something. We might have gotten together, but I don't really recall. So um, Ryan and, uh, and Ashley and you uh, tend to do the most of these things. Um, like you guys have this, you know. Uh, it, I mean, obviously you, you guys are all friends and, uh, and you're close because of this. Is it like, uh, something that you just, you're, you're just adoring the fact that you get to do this. Is it like, uh, or, I mean, I'm not saying it's just you three, but at the same time, like you, you three seem to be at the forefront of a lot of these conventions that I see pictures for and stuff like that. What yeah. kind of times are you guys having in, you know, 30 years. Later. I mean, we, we, we have a blast. Like I said, I yeah. mean, some of these things are, I mean, some, it's a lot of work and sometimes exhausting and there's a lot of travel, but yeah. uh, like I said, if you're doing one a month or like a convention, like you're just going to get burned out and not want to do it. Um, yeah. You know, but if you do a couple a year and, and they mean something um, and you know, you're right. I mean, it's, it's mostly me, Ryan and Ashley. Yeah. Um, not just at conventions, but at like screenings or uh, you know, Fred, Fred will join every mm -hmm. once in a while. Uh, and then Steven will go and uh, a lot of times the monsters will show up, you know, which nice. is all, cause that's a whole other side of it. Yeah. A lot of times conventions are different because they want everybody or they'll yeah. just want the monsters one year and then they just want us the other. So they spread it out. Oh. Um, but when we're all together, it's, it's insane. Yeah. <laughs> like it yeah. That's really insane. That's um, cool. But you know, then there's, you know, there's obviously two different, um, you know, experiences, you know, on the convention kind of circuit, uh, and then there's like, you know, every, I mean, Monster Squad plays at a, at a screening, you know, almost every weekend somewhere like yeah. that. And it was really, really, it really did. And so people yeah. would always invite, do you want to come to, you know, yeah. Portland, to, you know, we're doing a screen or like, I, I can't, or like, do you want to go to Jacksonville or Denver or, you know, whatever. And, you know, I try to go to some that I can, yeah. um, the ones that you don't like, you just can't go to every single one. Cause it no. literally played every weekend somewhere yeah. for yeah. 10, 10 or 12 years. <laughs> Um, but Ryan and I and Ashley go to some of them. We love it when it's at a film festival or something. So there's other stuff to do. Um, but, you know, and then 
during the 30th anniversary year was probably, you know, probably the largest compacted, you know, 12 months of doing something Yeah, because it was a big anniversary. And that was also the year we were shooting the documentary. So everything kind of lined up and we had three or four big events to go to conventions. Uh, we had screenings and then I had ended up setting up um, uh, the Alamo draft house chain had called me um, and said, are you interested? We want to do a 30th anniversary tour. And I was like, well, do you, are you, do you want to get in touch with Ryan and you know, Ash were like, oh my God, if we do that, that'd be better. And so we put everybody in contact, set up the schedule and we went on this crazy 17 city tour in 17 days. That's and uh, like rock stars. It, it was literally a rock tour yeah. uh, with a couple differences. One is I had a production crew. With, so not only was I me, yeah. but then you sort of, you know, in, I had kind of dragged Ryan and Ashley <laughs> with me on this <laughs> tour. Um, but uh, so you're doing that and you got to interface with the crowd and you do an intro and you do a QA and a after every screening and then you sign stuff out in the lobby. Uh, and yeah, it was 17 cities in 17 days, but over half of those cities had double screenings. So you had double things every night and then yeah, yeah. stay up late, wake up early, get on the plane and go to the next city or get in the car and go to the next thing. The thing that made it different about a rock concert is, is I also had my production crew with me filming the whole thing. So it wasn't just show up and leave. It was show up, do this, and also make a documentary. Yeah. So I'm looking over here doing this, and I'm looking over here doing that, taking yeah. pictures here, signing this, doing Q&A. Ryan and Ashley are just getting dragged around the country yeah. uh, and were absolute troopers. But we also had Ashley's baby. So oh, we gosh. had her six, uh, her first child, Ayla, was 16 months old uh -huh. and went on the entire run. And so wow. we were just sort of like this, uh, uh, you know, kind of crazy kind of tour of, and we all just went into like family mode, like, cause it's hard to travel. Yeah. With Kudos to Ashley. And like, oh. I, you know, I, I'd be interested, like I'd be in the rental car and be like, okay, we got to stop at Sprouts or Whole Foods. Cause we got to get Ayla's food. Cause that's where it is. Cause you can't bring everything you to get it as you go. And, oh um, you know, she ate very healthy, which was amazing. And so we had to go to make sure we strategize and then, checking in through security at an airport that's a whole thing with the carrier and the yeah. stroller and and the bags and so we just teamed up and just became like okay grab this bag from ashley let's get ayla through like you know do this and uh cool. by like the third or fourth day it was just like a routine <laughs> and yeah, we knocked yeah. It out of the, and we just knocked it out of the park but i'm sure those guys were exhausted um i was exhausted my production crew was super exhausted um but i hope all the time like, it was it was yeah no kidding like, but who, that 17 city tour was, was insane. And we got a lot of fantastic stuff for the documentary. That's great, that. man. But that's, uh, you know, that's living, right. That's, uh, that's doing. Oh, I love, I loved every minute of it. Reaping the rewards. Uh, right? Yeah. yeah. And sure. you know, and that, and that's definitely one of those times where whether it's a convention or an appearance and I'm usually sort of the, again, the, you know, insufferable kind of bossy one, getting everybody in the right place and, you know, inviting them to this or telling them they should do this or, hey, we got to be at the table at, you know, in five minutes, let's go. And, you know, most of them are like, you know what, I'm an adult, leave me alone. <laughs> like, I'll get there <laughs> if I want to. Uh, but then, you know, with the tour and the dot, I was like, no, look, we need to do this. We got to get this. Do you mind shooting this footage on camera? And I just, I ran those two cats, you know, through the ringer for those three really? weeks and the production crew. Uh, and I didn't feel exhausted until about a week after all that was over. <laughs> then I really, was like, yeah. you collapsed, right? Yeah. <laughs> but then I love kind of that on the go kind of mentality so much that, you know, a year later when we were, after we festivaled, uh, you know, you just travel all around to a film festival thing, which is kind of the same thing. It's more, mm -hmm. it's more of a party than, than it is work. Uh, but then I did another, I did a 21 city Alamo tour with the documentary with yeah. myself and Henry who made the doc. So and we just, how did you come up with this idea? How, how did you come up with this idea to like, or did someone say to you, Hey, this is, you know what? Everybody wants to see this. Let's, let's get out there and do this. Or was this your idea? Cause this isn't, you know, uh, idea of people what? would Which, do uh, like, what idea the tour well yeah like i mean or making like, the documentary <laughs> well no no not making it but like the tour yeah. because like francis ford coppola didn't go out on a hearts of darkness tour um you know like this this is something that you know is kind of unique it, yeah it's a cool idea but like how did that that come about it, it was mainly because of that 30th anniversary tour and, and my relationship with the alamos as a company Okay. Uh, and then also with the individual locations and those creative directors that run those stores, yeah. um, you know, they're all like, because we shot that, that 30th anniversary tour when my crew was there, those crowds were buying tickets to see Monster Squad and to meet us. Yeah. 
No one knew there was a documentary being made until we told them on that, that night. So and so okay. they were part of it. And so yeah. they were super jazzed. Yeah. So that was really cool. Then when you finally finish the movie and it's ready to be seen, it was a no brainer to just, you know, get in touch, you know, with my people at the, my people, with the people at the Alamo yeah. and say, Hey, are you interested in this? Because we're willing to go on the road and let's do a little mini run. Uh, and that was in October of last, uh, not last year, the year before. And they were like, let's, um, with, <laughs> what was ironic is because I knew a bunch of the locations were interested. Like, as soon as this is done, bring, please bring it here. We'll make a night out of it. Yeah. And I was like, oh, okay. And I was like, instead of going one-offs and doing all this crazy stuff, let's do it at all compacted and see. If, but that's a big logistics thing from corporate on down to the, to the store locations. Uh, and so I got in touch with that office and they were like, this sounds neat. I know a couple of people had mentioned it a while ago. Um, yeah, and I was thinking... Uh, I was like, we did 17 cities and half of those had double screenings. So, uh, oh gosh, you know, this documentary, it's different. It's not Monster Squad. It's not, the, it's not the three of us as cast members going. And I remember I was at Comic-Con on the phone with the office for Alamo. I was like, I mean, I think we could get like, I would love to get 10 locations that are jazzed. You know, eight would be the minimum. I think nine's probably what I, in my mind, I know who wants it. I think it's nine, maybe 10. Mm -hmm. And she was like, okay, let's, uh, you know, we have a meeting at the end of the week. Um, I'll write this down and I'll get back to you and we'll put it out to all the stores to see who's interested. Cause then you got to start the lunch. <laughs> she came back and she goes, uh, 25 want to do it. Wow. And wow. I was like, Oh my God. Uh, and I was like, what? She goes, but I think that's, I think that's too many. Um, you know, what, what do you think? And I was like, uh, well, what's the scheduling look like? And should we, should we go to one that we've never been to, or should we go to one we've been to five times, you know, so many times. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so we, we kind of nipped some stuff in the bud for logistics reasons Yeah, and took a couple of the Texas stores out of the mix because they just aren't close to each other. <laughs> and because uh, Corpus Christi is next to not, I mean, there's not close to anything. <laughs> and, and then it had to do with schedules and, and, and what they could do because it was in October, which is a big month for things like, you know, yeah. Alamos and special, special nights. So you had to work. So we ended up doing 21. <laughs> Wow, and, wow. <laughs> uh, yeah so i just, really cut you know, it we, <laughs> cut it down. yeah we really cut it down by, <laughs> by four and um you know added a couple new locations that we've never been to did the obvious ones that we had been before and you know so, you know some of the cities you know doubled up like phoenix like lauren knight who's you know a great friend of mine now she she runs the alamos and in, in phoenix there's one in chandler and one in there was a new one opening up in tempe she's like i, I want them both like we're doing them both i was like but wait, should we do both or make it like one? Like, what? she's no, we're doing both. And like all the like, and then Denver was like, you got to come to our new location. Awesome. And uh, and I'm like, what? What is happening? Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> and <laughs> and so it ended up being very cool and exhausting again. But I, look, that's I, I'll do a tour every month. I mean, that, that's yeah, like, for sure. Like, man. Uh, I, I'd love to have twelve movies to go tours on every month. I would just switch over. It'd be great. No uh, but it was it was a great reception and. The reason I wanted to do the tour not only was to get exposure for the film, but also it was at the time we were doing a distribution deal. And that was going to be, again, the announcement of, hey, this movie's now coming out. You're the first to know. And if the timing had been better, we would have even had like a stack of the Blu-rays to like, yeah. you know, people purchase on that tour. Oddly enough, I didn't know that the delays of the deal getting done uh, over a year ago. Um, we had the tour, couldn't make the announcement because the deal wasn't signed yet. Uh, didn't know that this deal was going to end up not happening. Yeah. And so our big kind of first, you know, we had a worldwide distribution deal with one company that we were very jazzed about doing it with. Um, it, it ended up not happening. And we didn't know that until March of last year, right when wow. the pandemic was starting. And oh, so yeah. in March and April, we had to start from scratch about getting a release out for this movie. And that's why we're in the situation that we're in now, why it's been such a long gap from our festival run and that tour to actually release. And we yeah. ended up, you know, yeah. fortunately getting with Gravitas Ventures and releasing in US and Canada on VOD, um, at least get something out there right now and a Blu-ray 
uh, in October. So we've yeah. been out, you know, for three months and, um, you know, doing well and, you know, we got to do better. You know, we got to, it's yeah. about word of mouth. Like everybody, you know, hopefully everybody that, you know, listens to you will go out and watch it or at least rent it uh, sure. on your VOD. And right now we're working on the international kind of uh, yeah. release on it. So that that's a whole process and it takes a long okay. time. So, that explains um, so hopefully why in the next couple of weeks. It. Cause I couldn't find it for the longest time. I'm like, where the heck can I see this? It thing? W- not until October 27th of three months ago. That yeah. You been able so, to see it. And so I have it pre-ordered. It's got a date. Yeah. It's got a date of 2018 because that's when we festival and that's yeah. not really counts as the release date. Yeah. So it was driving me crazy for a little bit, but I got it ordered. It's coming. It's in the mail. So when I watch it, I'll definitely, uh, uh, send you a, oh, a thanks. message. Yeah. And, Abs- or yeah. yeah. Send me a message or follow I'm up, dying. talk about it. Let your people know. Um, for sure. You know, yeah, they can, no, it's, uh, uh, you know, it, right now it's still only available uh, VOD on, uh, you know, iTunes. Um, you know, you can get the Blu-ray from Amazon. Um, yeah. A couple okay. of the retailers, uh, you know, Google Play, uh, you know, YouTube, you know, wherever you can rent off your cable company or Dish Network, whatever for yeah. you know, on demand or video on demand, um, you can rent it or digitally download it uh, or buy the physical media like you did, which is right. Yeah. Because that's old school. To me, that's more fun. <laughs> yeah, school. it is. Right? Um, it takes up shelf space, but it's cool. And yeah. I, I appreciate that because I know there's a lot of Monster Squad fans that, you know, whether they saw, you know, the, the documentary at an Alamo on a tour, or they saw it at a film festival. <laughs> yeah. um, when the Blu-ray came out, they bought it because they have a whole shelf of Monster Squad stuff. And they wanted yeah. to, this is sort of like the 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 maybe not the last piece but maybe the next piece yeah but probably the last piece of physical media that has something to do with monster squad well, um and you know, you know it, it might be a nice little bookend and, and and i think people love to add that to collection because what's great about it is especially all those people that were at the alamo tour or at these festivals or these conventions they're in the documentary because the documentary is about them and their yeah. story it's not about us the, the documentary is not about the movie yeah. it's not about us it's about how things like movies such yeah. as monster squad can connect and impact, you know, impact you as, and, and change your life. So that kind of raises the question that you've heard a million times. Why was the love not there in 1987? And everybody's got theories of why. And I mean, I guess yeah. there's a little bit of everything in there. But for you, if you were to narrow it down to one reason that you believe Monster Squad did not succeed in 1987, but thankfully is love now. What would that be? Uh, I think the two main things, and when you see the documentary, we go into some funny stuff here. Um, I, I think the rating hurt it at mm-hmm. the time. And I think the contradictory marketing campaign hurt it. Mm-hmm. And then one of the bigger impacts at the time is the only movie reviews that you got were your local newspaper. Yeah. And a majority, a majority of the reviewers didn't like this movie. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it was more so the fault of the system at the time that when you release a movie in the 80s in movie theaters, you have 48 hours, maybe 72 hours to make an impact or reach some certain number that someone sets that you'll continue to, you're either out Mm -hmm. or you continue to play. And what's interesting about Monster Squad with, it's a combination of all those things that Mm -hmm. I was mentioning. It's not just one reason. The one reason is the combination and confluence of all these things. And when you had a contradictory marketing campaign leading up to a movie that was PG-13, uh, you end up seeing this marketing campaign that half of it was super campy and not understandable. Yeah. And kids are like, I don't know what that is. Yeah. Uh, I'm not interested. And then you see the trailer for the movie and it's like super scary and kind of dark and, and, you know, you know, with some danger in there and parents are like, I'm not taking my kid to this movie. Yeah. And that couples with the rating of PG 13 that parents are not going to take their kids and buy a ticket themselves to go sit in this kid's movie that they think the kids may or may not be old enough to Mm -hmm. see. Mm -hmm. And then the main part is that I think it was a little ahead of its time, just an audience um, audience kind of um, saturation in that the older kids, the 14, 15 and 16 year olds to them seeing the advertisement, it was a, it was too kid oriented for them. Mm-hmm. They were too yeah. cool. They were, they were 15. They're not going to yeah. go see this movie. Yeah. They went and saw the Lost Boys, which opened two weeks prior to us. So yeah. our, 
release date was a weird thing too. Yeah. I know they released it in the summer because kids are out of school to go, but this really should have been a Halloween movie. Yeah. Um, but then the younger kids that were 9, 10, 11, this movie was way too dark, way too dangerous, way too <laughs> yeah. scary. So they don't want to go see it, let alone their parents are going to not let them see it. Yeah. And so I always joke over a long time. I was like, so that leaves you a very small window of the mid older kids and the younger kids. You got this little window yeah. of what we now call tweens. Yeah. And this was a tween movie before that term was invented. Yeah. Yeah. in my mind and so i always joke about that that had had you know the industry or studios known that what tweens were and how to market to tweens mm -hmm. it's easier now with internet and social media because that's your yeah. main audience like you get them really easy but if there was a way to get to tweens back in that day this movie would have taken off yeah yeah. Uh, and we would have made, I always joke, like we would made the first tween movie and we would have just finished rapping on Monster Squad 11 Breaking Dawn. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so um, it, it's one of those yeah. interesting things to look back, you know, not with any animosity or, or you know, kind yeah, of no, a, sure. acerbic tongue, but uh, it, it's an interesting look back of why something may not hit. Yeah. And where this movie worked is when you went to see it, because you said you saw it. Yeah, you saw in a movie. You saw in a movie theater. Yes, I did. Yeah. So, did you go home and tell your friend in the neighborhood, "Man, I just saw this movie. I'm going to go see it again." Like, you got to come with me. And then it wasn't in the theater the next weekend because it didn't perform on opening weekend. So it never yeah. got that chance to grow in the neighborhood. Yeah. However, everybody that I know that saw this movie as a kid in the theater went to school or went in their neighborhood in their cul-de-sac and told their friends about it and said, I'm going to go see it again. You got to come with me. And when they went to the mall or went to the Cineplex, it wasn't there. Mm -hmm. And they didn't understand why. <laughs> and it's because yeah. of that first 48 hours will will make or kill a movie release. And I think yeah. that's an unfair thing. It's different today because you can put something on that will have a very niche audience uh, on you know VOD or on a Blu-ray release and it will do gangbusters yeah. because you can get to those people. But back in the day, it was about wide release, wide numbers. Sure. You have to reach a certain bar by you know seven o'clock on Saturday night, otherwise yeah. your movie's yeah. dead. And I think that's unfair. It's yeah. unfortunate. I think see for me, I think there was a couple of things. I think now we are as opposed to the eighties. I feel like we're more nostalgic now. Um, I think in the eighties, you know, it was about you know forty years since those monster movies, and it was all about you know Freddy and Jason and like you know the modern things, and and those things weren't as appreciated as I think that we appreciate older films now. Um, I I think that had a little bit to do with it, but I I, I agree with you. It was, you know. Is it is it a is it a movie for kids? Is it a movie for? But the thing is, is again now we've evolved. Like I mean, because if you look at all these superhero films, they're not they're not for like an eight year old to watch, but they're watching them, you know, because they've there there's there's they're action, flashy and there's, splashy, yes. But there's they're, they're there's animated, death in there. There's adult. yeah yeah there's sure. adult topics. There's death. There's sexual innuendos, se sexual situations, and stuff like that. So they're not exactly. Um, clean, easy films for a kid to watch, but they're watching them now. I don't think that back in the day that was the case. I think it was, you know, the the rating system was a lot more rigid, and uh, and I think that that, in my opinion, um, may have had a, an effect on that. But oh, certainly, I mean, if if Monster Squad had a PG, it would have been a whole other world. I think yeah. um, because it, it would have done better because more people would have gone early because they just saw an obstacle right before the even before the movie came yeah. out. But when you're talking about nostalgia, um, nostalgia is not really anything new. It's just different. And for us, it's because we've gotten into the point where we long for those you know days of yore where we yeah. felt awesome and young and indestructible and enthusiastic. Um, and what's interesting in the '80s. The nostalgia movies were current modern movies, but set in the 50s and early 60s. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, Greece was a little ahead of its time, but, you know, you had Stand By Me, you had Cry yeah. Baby, you had all these movies that were, you know, for boomer, you know, what would be baby boomer kids, you know, growing up. Because it's about the nostalgia button starts about 25 years mm -hmm. after whatever time frame you're looking at, whether it's high school or college or junior high or coming of age or, you yeah. know, whatever. And in the 80s, that was 
that was the fifties. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so yeah. That was time for fifties and sixties kind of feel and look. And that's why there's some awesome movies. Uh, yeah. And that's why dirty dancing works. And that's yeah. huge because you know, the, 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 the new parents or the just getting married of 1987 we mm-hmm. like, oh my God, this is dirty dancing. This was my childhood. Like this yeah. is the music like I listened to and my parents listened to. Yeah. And you know, this is amazing. Yeah. And so it's just that little bit of gap of timing. Yeah. Uh, and we're in this kind of big gap and now it's technology. And, you know, we all grew up on comic books and cartoons of our time, which was yeah. our big and, you know, big entertainment focus. But now we get to see our comic books moving and yeah. talking. Yeah, uh, exactly. And so we right. want That's that, cool. right? Yeah. Even though comic books, aren't just from the eighties. I mean, they're fairly old, you know, when you get to the eighties, yeah. Yeah, uh, but no, you just couldn't true. really make, you couldn't make uh, all of our comic book movies, like even Superman and, mm-hmm. you know, Spider-Man TV show of the eighties and Superman, you know, with um, Christopher Reeve, those are great movies, but they're not really super cool because it doesn't look like, it looks like people in a suit fake yeah, flying yeah. Yeah. with bad effects. It doesn't yeah. look like the comic book is coming to life in my face. Exactly, which we yeah. can do now. And that's what all yeah. of these comic book movies look like. It looks like the comic book movie is coming to yeah. life in your face. Um, yeah. They're enjoyable. Sure. I don't know how much lasting power they have, but they certainly are enjoyable. No, for sure. For sure. But I just feel like, you know, nowadays you could, um, you know, like nostalgically a kid could watch Jaws and, and, and you know, an E.T. And, and get the, uh, I don't mean to just pick on Spielberg because he was kind of yeah. good. But um, but like, I mean, they could watch these movies and I think they can they can hold their attention better 40 years after the fact than when Monster Squad came out, for example, kids liked horror, but not a lot of kids were like me where I like the universal monsters. You know what I mean? At the time, the universal very monsters niche, yeah. were like, niche. you know, cereals, you know, breakfast cereals and, yeah. and you know, and cartoons and stuff like that. They right. weren't really too many people that seen them and they knew of them of course right but you know so i think that you know and again also this has a lot to do with just like how easily accessible every every movie in the world is these days but uh no doubt but yeah anyways i mean there's a lot of things that could be debated i mean it's definitely a a movie that uh uh, would you would you want to see it remade or rebooted Uh, no i mean if i mean the here's the thing like we've not remade or rebooted. No. Um, uh, a sequel is a different story with a continuation or a passing of the torch. Um, I'm actually more interested, even though it would probably take me out of any of it unless I created it. But I think there's a, there's there's pre stories in our yeah. in our world. Dracula has been walking around for a hundred years. Mm-hmm. What, what's he been doing? Yeah. I think I think it's a fantastic. <laughs> I think it's a very interesting ten episode Netflix show. Yeah. Of, you know, like an hour and 20 minutes each of Dracula walking and each episode, you know, covers a decade. Yeah. Um, and leads up to 1987 from when, because that's how they blew it in 87 in our movie. Yeah. He gets away, but we don't yeah. see that because the scene got cut. So he's been walking around for a hundred years waiting for this moment. Yeah. And so I want to see what Dracula was doing during the Roaring Twenties, during yeah. World War One, during yeah. the Second World, like I think he's a part of all of this shit. Yeah. Like you yeah. know, he's you know he can insert himself in there and, and do some bad de- bad deeds or, you know, uh, you know, and and learn knowledge. And he's just and he just at every decade because he looms, he just gets you know more pissed and angry because he's waiting for a certain moment that he can't have for another seventy five or fifty two years or whatever it is. But we can kind of go through time as Dracula is walking around and being a part of stuff. And there's a great line in Monster Squad that everybody asks what it means. Cause like when he reanimates Frankenstein, he goes, it's been a long time, my friend. Mm-hmm. And Frankenstein goes long time master. And he was like, what does that mean? I was like, yeah. there's obviously yeah. a story there. And I was like, yeah. I want to see that. Yeah. Uh, but no, I don't think a remake get on a reboot, it. Cause, cause you can't, uh, I like the idea. Get on I it. don't <laughs> think, um, I don't think a remake or reboot works mm-hmm. because we've seen it a dozen times already. Mm-hmm. If you want a reboot of Monster Squad, because you can't make Monster Squad in the manner that they made Monster, because we you can't have the language, you can't have the situations, they can't be shooting guns, you can't be being yeah. blown up in a treehouse. You can't be. You can still put kids in peril now, but it's different. Yeah, and it's, the situations it's... you can't have, so you can't remake Monster Squad. Um, but things have been inspired by stories like Monster Squad, and we've seen them a ton of times. Yeah. It's called Stranger Things. Yeah. 
um you know and it's called um you know the you know the it's called it yeah uh, and it was, there's a funny story that you know fred and shane are quoted in a, i can't remember what it was it was a trade or a, a, a online online news site where they were in, you know in a meeting um about you know re re doing monster squad or continuing a story or doing something and i think it was at netflix i think it was was it netflix or somewhere else and they He's like, well, what do you think it is? And Fred's like, uh, well, I think it's this group of kids, and you know, they find this other kind of adventure with this thing and a and a and a monster villain or and a supernatural powers or something, and they have to battle that. And Shane Black apparently was in the room and goes, "That's it." <laughs> and everybody was like, "Yeah, well, that that sounds good." And Shane's like, "No, that's that's Stephen King's it. That's it." <laughs> and they go, "Oh shit!" And then I think there was kind of a realization and. I think one time Fred, you know, was was explaining to us and as a group or something. He's like, you know, we were talking about it with somebody, and um, they want they, they were talking to me about redoing something Monster Squad ask or Monster Squad IP, and said, um, you know, we want it to be, you know, kind of, you know, you know, obviously Monster Squad, but you know, have you seen Stranger Things? And have you seen that? And he's like, have you? <laughs> it's like, hey, like we've already done, like, do we really need to do this? It's been done. And I, I think Fred was in, you know, my vision of that day was Fred was in this weird position of being across the table from some sort of executives. And his thing is like, wait, you want me to, you want me to make something based on something that was ripping off something that I already made. I don't, I don't, I don't know if we need to do that because <laughs> who's going to watch that? Uh, so I just, I just envision that kind of conversation. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, see, if you're going to do anything, it's, it's got to be a sequel that has nothing, you know, that's totally a selfish yeah. uh, mood and, you know, and hopefully, you know, our characters would be in it. Uh, yeah. But I, I think it's a continuation and a passing of the torch thing. There's, there, there's a cool framework for a story out there. Um, awesome. But then I, I love the idea of, uh, you know, what happened before us. Yeah. The, the prequels. And... Yeah. Honestly, um, I, as we wrap this up, I want to say that uh, not only were you, uh, you know, a fantastic guest, and it was great to go back to talk about Monster Squad, but mm -hmm. I, I really, I'm appreciative, and I know a lot of fans are appreciative that someone like you, the star of this film, um, you know, embraces the film so much, and it means so much to you. Like, when you have a favorite film, and the star of that film or the filmmaker of that film, you know, really champions it and gets in front of it and brings the fans all the things that you have been doing over the last few years. It's really, really special. Like it, it's it's one of those hmm. things that fans couldn't ask for a better champion for the film than what you have been showing them. So, um, oh, know. well, I, look, I, I, I appreciate that. Um, I don't. I don't think I go through the day hunting for that, uh, and and but that's awesome to hear. So I, I certainly appreciate it. If anybody else feels that same way, I I, I thank them as well. Oh, I'm sure. Um, yeah. You know, a, you know, a lot of people have that. You know, ask that question. It's like, don't you get tired of talking about Monster Squad? And it's like, I talk about a lot of other stuff too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Monster Squad happens to be a lot of people's favorite subject, and you know, we mentioned '87 failing at the box office and not being this this big hit. Uh, but it's to me, it's so interesting because it's so singular and so unique of what's happening over the last 10, 12 years with this movie or 15 years now. Yeah. Uh, I don't see that happening a lot. Uh, and then me obviously being kind of that in the, that gatekeeper kind of to this movie with the fan, you know, over the years and, and, and as is Ryan and Ashley and, and Fred to some extent, uh, you know, to interface with this fan base. Um, I, two things I would, I always say I'd, I'd much rather be associated with something that people still want to talk about 30 years later. Yeah. Than have a giant movie in 87 that no one remembers. That's right. Yeah. The yeah. only person that a giant hit in 87 that really affects would be Fred and his, maybe his career. And so I wish that was different. Um, but this dynamic of talking about this movie after 30 years, and I've had people tell me that we're, and we have a whole second generation of Monster Squad fans because the OGs yeah. show their kids and other kids are fans. And yeah. I know the kids, this is, ins this is insane. I don't know a lot of movies and fan bases that have this kind of dynamic. Um, and Just I kiss. 
Just kids, right? Just kids. And that's only because Gene Simmons won't <laughs> let it die. Yeah. Um, little do you know, you're not actually seeing original members of Kiss. On, <laughs> there's different guys in makeup, but that's just an inside joke. Um, and I've met Gene. It, it's there's amazing Kiss stories, and he's a yeah. cool dude. I've been in conventions with him. It's insane. Yeah, um, and I'm a Kiss fan. I'm a Kiss. Yeah, fan. Man, Dynasty, me too. Dynasty's Dynasty's my favorite Kiss album. Really? Um, wow. Magic yeah. touch. I, yeah, that, you know, 2000, 2000 Man's my favorite. 2000 Man's an awesome song. Uh, Charisma, good. Charisma ain't too bad either, but uh, yeah, uh, it's a, a great, a, it's a great album. It is, um, man. No, sure, know something. The baseline. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Right. Um, and, I'm with you. <laughs> you know the lyric. You really like my seven my, inch heels is a great, is a great line <laughs> from a rock dude. Not many um, guys could say that. You like the way the wheels roll. Um, yeah, no, it's it's it just oozes with like you know, uh, it's crazy. Yeah, it's awesome. but yeah, I, you know, I think it's with, and that's what cre- that's what became that's what Wolfman's Got Nards was was this story about these fans and this connection of why people are still talking about yeah. this movie and other movies. But I, you know, there may be a day that I get tired of you know telling onset stories or telling funny things that I've learned later about those and. Uh, I, I constantly keep learning so it doesn't really get stale. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I hear more story, even though the stories sound very similar, they're all very individual to these people. Yeah. And one thing that um, I think myself and, and Ryan and Ashley do a very good job of when we're interacting with fans is you may be at a convention and there may be 15 people or eight people waiting in line or 50 people waiting in line yeah. to get an autograph or take a photo or ask you a question. And I, I don't like when there's a long line. That means a lot of people are there for you. But I like when you get to spend a little time with people. Yeah. Because you just do the, the factory, you know, the Henry Ford kind of sign and, you know, tur- churn and burn type thing doesn't work. That's yeah. Jason Nesbitt and Galaxy Quest. And I've seen, I've seen celebrities do that shit all the time at conventions. Yeah. And it chaps my ass. Because um, I'm like, why are you here? Yeah. But why are you here? Yeah, everybody's there um, for different reasons. And I'd reasons. name a few, but I won't. I mean, they yeah. sit there, they never look up, they just do this and sign yeah. and pass it on and you know, whatever. Um we whether there's two people in front of you or 20, um you, you get to that may be the 50th person you've talked to that day, but it's the first time and probably the only time that they're gonna ever talk to you. And you owe them at least 60 seconds hopefully 90 of, of connecting with them and kind of getting their story or learning about them. Even though a lot of the stuff is, I mean, it's like, they almost all say the same thing, but it's all, all completely different. Yeah. And, and I, I, I realized that after a couple of years that this kind of resurgence wasn't dying down. And that was part of that reason. And I'm glad that a lot of people talk about how open and connected Ashley gets with people at a convention or a screening or how cool Ryan was interfacing with fans or, you know, being appreciative or thanking me for, you know, you took some time and I had my son and like, you want to take a picture with him. And, but, you know, so now he's like that, no one does that. And I was like, why wouldn't someone do that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think what it is, is, you know, as you get older, you realize that uh, for me personally, um, and this isn't, you know, a, a, you know, self-congratulation or a, a, a big pat on my own back, but you realize that not very many people on the planet get to be in that position where someone wants to meet you, mm-hmm. right? Or spend time with you or, or, or pay to take a photo with you, which I can't stand that they have to pay to take. I was like, let's go out in the parking lot and just take a photo. Yeah. Um, yeah. And not very many people get to be in that position to have all of this attention coming to you and if you like attention this is just it's just like mm-hmm. you know it's like every you know narcotic you could ever you know want you're like oh my god people want to talk to me um but even when you understand that that not very many people get to do that um you have to um appreciate that a little bit and, th- and then respect that dynamic uh, and then when you do, it just gets even bigger. You're like, oh, yeah. I made a mistake. Now I'm opened up to this and I realize what's going on and it's just <laughs> flooding in. And, um, you know, it's like I say, there's other movies and I'm, an, I'm a big fan of other awesome movies. I'm a fan of other actors. I'm friends with some of those actors. Um, I'm jealous that they're in movies that I wasn't in. Uh, but I also know that's also comes the other way sometimes. And yeah. 
Um, I, you know, it, it's just a big, unique thing that not when you look at how many people are on the planet, let alone, you know, in in this country or in your state, like not, it's a very small percentage. So you, you, you shouldn't really be an ass about it. Yeah. Um, because there's no reason to number one, but then you should also be like, I kind of respect this dynamic. And I appreciate the fact that um, I get to do this and I might as well make it fun. Yeah. And hopefully it's fun for the people that we get to hang out with. Usually a perspective is like, you know, belongs to the one, but you know, you you're bang on your perspective is bang on. And you are a you are a good guy. I mean, it's it's obvious. <laughs> it's, uh, I hope. I hope. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm sure I fall short compared to others, but hopefully, I'm way ahead of the game with you know others as well. So as it, long as it, I'm not on the bottom of the pile. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. No, it's honestly, uh, you know, I I wish you all the future success that you deserve. Um, and I I know that you know um, I, I have a feeling Monster Squad will be in your future until the day you uh pass away 90 years from now it it, it may but yeah, hopefully, uh but hopefully. that's not but like you said and like uh, i agree i mean that's not a bad thing i uh i do wish you all the best i hope that um you know we get to talk again and yeah let's uh, do it awesome awesome i uh, when i see that when i after i watch this documentary which i've been waiting for like okay freaking ever right. to watch. yeah We'll, uh, Let's do that. We'll Watch that. that. We'll come back. The first half, we'll talk about the doc, and the other half, we'll talk about whatever random stuff we, we can come, come up awesome. with. Awesome. That sounds amazing. <laughs> I, I, I welcome that, and uh, I will touch base with you soon. Do you want to have a last word here? Uh, no, I appreciate it. This is, you know, another thing, like, you know, it's, uh, you know, ever since, you know, a month before the release or, you know, all the time, you know, it's, you know, you know, to be able to have access to technology and be able to, you know, I love being with people and being I, like, I'd rather be in your place doing your podcast right next to you or across the table. Cause it's yeah. a whole different dynamic, but you know, you can only reach so many people that way. Cause yeah. you know, you know, with so much gas, but uh, you know, we have this technology and we get to interface and we get to interact and connect and, you know, it gets to, you know, kind of sp spread the, you know, kind of, you know, you get to bring more people into, into your group and, you know, hopefully your people appreciate your show. I'm sure that's why they hang out and watch it. Uh, you know, I hope they, you know, enjoyed this, you know, you know, two hours of oh, hanging out with my unsufferable ass, but uh, you know, it's, um, this was you know, cool. it, it's fun to chat and talk about stuff and um, you know, support the people that you enjoy because yeah. uh, you guys, you know, you guys are the only reason we guys uh, get to do this and um, it's we're, we're only here I, I don't think a lot of